Kind of. Somewhat. Keep going, man. Just keep it going. Yeah. <laughs> keep it going. What we're going to do is uh, we'll, we'll probably <laughs> we'll give a chance again in a little bit if some folks show up who might not be expecting us to be here right. to one to see if there's public participation. Nope. Deborah okay. Ball's not here until 1.30. So uh, the next item would have been and would be if, if Michelle's willing to do that to move to item N, which is the discussion regarding NASB and the awards, nominations, et cetera. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I still feel pretty green as a NASB delegate. And, um, <clears throat> but everyone should have gotten this very long document with changes in the bylaws. And uh, I've looked them over. Kathy's looked them over. I think they're pretty, you know, they're to comply um, more closely with uh, Robert's Rules of Order. It's nothing um, that seems to be extraordinary with them. It seems very level-headed. So I would recommend... Um, Endorsing the uh, bylaw changes, and um, if you have any questions, um, <coughs> that you need a motion to endorse. Then mm -hmm. she makes a motion. I'll oh. second it. Okay. okay. Um, I'm making a motion to endorse the uh, the bylaws changes to the NASB, the changes to the NASB bylaws, um, as submitted. Um, support. Thank you. By Michelle, supported by Dan. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Okay. They, they also are requesting um, nominations um, for the board of directors. The election, uh, the, the ballots must be, let's see. Um, the, they're ex accepting nominations, but we don't have a board meeting we don't have a board meeting in July, correct? Or do right. we have a board meeting in July? No, we don't. No. Okay, so we don't have a board meeting in July. So we're not, our next one is in August, and they want the ballots to be received for uh, nominations for the board of directors by July 15th. So I am not sure if anybody has um, uh, any concerns about that, or uh, I am planning to attend the, the NASB meeting in the end of July. Um, and how we should confer on that, I'm not sure. And could use some people who might have more experience um, on this. What, what what should be the direction, um, given that uh, I don't have any nominees to bring forward or or candidates to bring forward to endorse for who we should vote for? Um, Dan looks open to nomination. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 leaning forward. <laughs> <laughs> so is there any um, suggestions on how we should proceed, given that, uh, or should I just vote Seriously. for the... Use your judgment. Am, Use my judgment. I am completely happy with you using your judgment <laughs> in voting for whomever you deem appropriate as our designated NASB representative. Yeah, okay. I said that. Right. That sound good by consensus? And mm -hmm. okay. I think Nordstrom or one of those, that's their whole policy book, is use your best judgment, literally. Right. It's one page. Okay. There's also a list here for nominees for uh, Distinguished Service Award. I was going to nominate Kathy, but she already got it in the past. <laughs> never been a two time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Friend of Education Award. You'll see the, the um, forms in the back here. Um, it's it's, Ju it's have July 5th is the date that the nominations have to be in. So if there is any um, uh, suggestions or if you want to, uh, to do that, um, be great. Craig, so. if you do the right thing a year from now, maybe this nomination. <laughs> there you go. My aspirations are limited. <laughs> and then the Policy Leader of the Year Award. So there's three awards here that are being no, banned, but, it, but no. they need to be in by July 5th. Um, oh my God. So that's my report. Oh, we had a question? Richard, yes, sir. Institutional okay. memory last time around, mm -hmm. two out of three of our nominees uh, got their awards <laughs> from NASB. Um, Elizabeth Bauer for um, what was the I forget what the three service yeah. award is. Uh, so friend of education, uh, uh, leader, and then and then service award. Yeah, yeah. So. Policy leader of the year award, friend of education award, and distinguished service. So I think Elizabeth Bauer was distinguished service, and uh, we had nominated Diane Ravitch for. Uh, <laughs> Wish she didn't get it though. Carol Goss. Carol Goss. Okay. Yeah, we could we could nominate her again. Skelman, actually. Yeah. Diane Ravitch. Yeah. 
Okay. Oh, I move we Which recommend one? Dan, Diane Ravitch for the current or the friend of education or the pilot friend of education, I guess. Okay. Um, I, I support. It was moved by Kathy to, to nominate Diane Ravitch. Diane Ravitch for the which of those? Friend of Education. Friend of Education Award. Yeah. And it was supported by Michelle. Yes, ma'am. Uh, given her recent blogging, uh, I find her hugely controversial. She's opposing Common Core. Um, and so while I respect her, I've known her for many years, I think that it would be a, a very, if, when somebody starts opposing Common Core at this point, I, I struggle with that. So I would post this nomination. I, like, I'm not a huge fan for similar reasons. Um, and how about Carol Goss? I, I would rather she have Carol. She did get it. <laughs> so she did get it. She did get it. Let's see. Who else do we know? Slash. Art well, Ellis in, in uh, posthumously. <laughs> so how, let, let me try to move this for a minute. There is a, a motion and, and a support. Any further discussion? I don't know that I really have to call a vote here. It might be awkward, but. Oh, or unless you or, or can withdraw it. You're with willing to withdraw it? With the support, we'll just yeah, withdraw. I think if it's not unanimous, it would be tough. Okay. Well. Okay. Are, are sitting state superintendents not, uh, not like, would it be inappropriate to nominate you? Would it be, in a, Mike, you're not a part of this conversation. Come <laughs> your ears. Would it be inappropriate to nominate uh, our own state superintendent for an award? We can nominate you to one. What's the uh, distinguished, distinguished Service Award? Mm -hmm. I think the Distinguished Service Award is for board, well, state I think, board members. I think oh, it's only for board members? Mm -hmm. We can make our own Thank you for the thought. award. These associate board <laughs> have their own outfit. When you do reach an age, a certain <laughs> ex officio board member. Distinguished. He is a board member. That's right. He's an ex officio board member. He's the head of our... Frank, would, yeah. He chairs the state board of education. Yeah. What the qualifications are, but... I think, I think we could make a good case nationally for... It's <laughs> yeah. good. So moved? Did you move? I didn't move it, but I would love to... I mean, I, if it's appropriate... Yeah. So moved. Choose support. Awkwardly, there's a motion. <laughs> and a second to that motion. Uh, for which? Distinguished service, was it? Okay. Distinguished service is what I said. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 All the same? Okay, well, thank you for that. that and Get even if it goes nowhere, I do appreciate it. Because <laughs> it won't go anywhere. But <laughs> The papers. <laughs> no, I, I do seriously. I thank you for the thought. And uh, can be a chance to go to my first NASB meeting. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. You know what? Well, Sorry, I just had a thought. Like, Who? Yeah. Carol. She already got it. Skillman got it. Don't. No. That's enough. Okay. Okay. Sorry. That's <laughs> a parliamentarian. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're going to oh, still see Martin any public participation. <laughs> Not yet. <clears throat> Do we have a, an intro of the new employee yet? Or let's let's try to work that out if we can, because we're moving ahead. Right. We're, we're <laughs> in a distinguished way. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, would you sure. prefer to go? Yeah, let's let's go, let's keep going and see if we can. So, would you like to go right to state? Board of Ed Mission and Priorities sure. then, which is the next one. And I think John is going to lead this discussion. Right. So um, coming out of our non-retreat planning session, we, out of, in that session, articulated uh, for the next couple years through Mike's tenure, but also for us as a board, two priorities that really are board's policy pushing role uh, and then five, is it five or six priorities that are, we support and that are uh, priorities for the department and Mike to implement and, and make, make blow life into six of those. Uh, and a mission statement, which you can see. Um, so I, I, w I guess I would propose, let's, um, let's just uh, talk about and hopefully approve the, the mission, the priorities, and then we can come back and talk more about the process of how we might advance the priority one, the, the promoting a, a plan for public education. Um, so you have the mission statement, which I very strongly support. You have two priorities. Uh, 
The first, which I rewrote a bit, so this is somewhat new from the draft that came out of the retreat from the department, uh, trying to capture the notion of us providing some leadership and shaping a, a vision and a, and a plan for organizing and financing schools towards achieving outcomes we care about. Priority two, uh, Michelle was the one person who came back with a few comments, which I think are not controversial, adding perhaps some items. This priority was meant to capture we, on an ongoing basis, want to be proactive in uh, being advocates for uh, important education policies, reforms, uh, and legislative interaction. So whether it's Common Core being an advocate for or support of the teacher evaluation design process that we'll be hearing more about, we want to be uh, always making a, uh, a directional in terms of our policy advocacy on a range of topics. Um, and then the other six were uh, a set of really good priorities around specific uh, items in terms of improving education from reducing health and safety barriers to learning to closing the achievement gaps, which you all have seen and familiar with. Michelle, did you want to just mention the couple items that you were suggesting we might also name, since we're naming some items in priority two? Yeah. Um, um, uh, special education. I thought it was worth, and the reason why I put special education is because um, there's a real focus on the, the mission is career ready, college ready community, and, um, and special education. Even though I think everyone, kids who have who are um, in special ed should hopefully get a career, maybe go to college, be ready for the community. I I think there needs to be also. It, it, I want to make sure that they're included in, in our mission because it, it there may be some question about whether they are. Um, so I think it's worth mentioning them. Also, um, we spent a lot of time talking about deficit schools and, um, and trying to um, uh, make sure that their, uh, uh, the issues around deficit schools are addressed too. So I would, I would include special education and um, schools in deficit. So with, with those additions to priority two, would it be appropriate? I, I would like to move support of the mission, the board priority, the department priorities, and then we can have discussion well, by as John. amended by Michelle. So you made support. Okay. It was supported by Dan. Uh, further discussion? A <coughs> question, <coughs> maybe Kathleen, for anybody at the table. I noticed the absence of higher education. Was that purposeful, or is it simply because of the autonomy of these bodies that you don't want to muck around with them? Uh, well, but then, a court decision that told us to stay out of it years ago. It was a court decision. Court decision. And I guess that hasn't stopped us in recent years from, as a poll board, actually, we, we worked through recommendations around funding and supports ranging from pre-K to through higher ed, because viewing it as our responsibility to uh, promote what is important to improve education, um, it, it doesn't stop us from attending to that, but I think in this, in this context, we were um, most focused on not leading with a higher education component, but also I think when, if we do something around how do we organize and fund schools, as we talked about last year, it needs to be sort of to and in connection with higher ed. You know, the transition through higher ed needs to be a piece of that look. And we, we do have priority five, which focuses on education preparation institutions, and that's where our piece of the higher ed uh, uh, comes into terrific. play. Yeah, and I, I would add to Cassandra's point, I mean, if we make progress there, we've changed the whole ball game. Yeah. And, I, and I really do think we're well on our way to a plan that will get there. I, we, we, we prefaced it a bit well, in its entirety, actually, in the mid-month. We're going to bring it back in August for, you know, discussion and thinking. And that we can really have an impact there, and we do have some authority there. <clears throat> That's kind of the difference in the spirit of what John was saying. I mean, we, we've actually taken two institutions and limited their ability to do teacher prep because they weren't at the point where they were basically meeting the criteria. Well, and I think the whole topic of P20 is going to come before you all down the road once there's a framework. And 
So I'd hope that that would still be something you could discuss, even if it's not one of your priorities. Yeah. yeah. But you know, Kathleen. I think Craig brings up a point. I think we ought to list in here teacher <coughs> preparation, because in this list and priority too, because it's one of our major things that we're working on. The teacher prep. Teacher preparation. We, we do have. We have it as as Educator five. We have educator evaluations under priority two. We have educator evaluations, common core standards and assessments, next gen, low performing schools mm -hmm. and early learning. Yeah. Uh, teacher preparations, yeah. teacher evaluations. And I guess I would I would just remind everybody that the naming of stuff in priority two is more illustrative, not exclusive, as it says. Mm -hmm. Meaning there are topics like that that we're gonna have advocacy mm -hmm. and policy positioning around. Um, um, well, the only reason I bring this up is because of the study that's due yeah. to, be, to be released today, uh, and I think it would be very smart. It, if, if we list it, then people know we are on top of that and concerned. Yeah. And it has been a major topic of conversation since I came back on the board in 2010. We have jurisdictional problems because all of them are separate um, yeah. and governed independently. And Would we have restrictions within the Constitution for what we have purview over. Um, but I think it's probably really appropriate to at least say that. Okay, good. Everyone good with that? And Lupe? To add it, Kathleen, if she says it. Is there any wording in there, John, that will allude to also including ESL, migrant ed, in those programs? Again, I, I, I personally, I'm not opposed. I'm for naming important topics that we are or want to do some positioning on. I just also, we don't have to name all of them to in this priority to be attending to them, but I'm I'm fully support. Well, maybe you could just put curriculum in here because that falls. Yeah, something all falls that under is curriculum. inclusive of everybody. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Further discussion, and that report did get released today, by the way, on higher ed. So the dean might have some comments, I would guess. So, any further discussion? Call the question. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great, thank you. What's the motion? To approve the mission priorities for board amendments. and department with your amendments. Yeah. Uh -huh. You still for it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 we talked about adding other things, and it just wasn't clear to me. It was a lot for public. There was a lot of discussion. Teacher of prep. Yeah. This, this and ESL. And other, anything else we want to put in there? Um, okay. Just mentioning at the retreat, there was a lot of hours put into yes. this. So and that's why I wanted to note that I didn't mean to. Uh, I'm glad everybody's supportive, and these are excellent uh, set of priorities, including the, the ones that uh, a lot of work went into framing up, and a lot of work will go into making real. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Can I talk a minute then about uh, the process for how we might? Uh, do our job on number one, which I was proposing. You know, I sent around to the board members. I just gave Craig my copy, um, some thoughts on that that included a um, a one-page uh, sort of process outline, and then a, an example from North Carolina that uh, some folks had sent me of a vision and agenda statement for public education coming out of their state board of education, N not not a model necessarily, but just an example of what a uh, a State Board of Education in terms of providing a framework for the public education agenda for the state has produced, which is um, illustrative of the kind of thing with, I think, maybe some more detail we might want to put out. I, I just feel that we as a board should get our orientation in, in broad strokes of what, uh, how we want to um, position ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the directions for school organization and school finance change. Uh, first to get our heads together and then use that as a sort of jumping off point as we engage, which I think we will be asking to continue that discussion with the Appropriations Committee on a bipartisan basis. What are our ideas for school finance? Uh, continue, I hope, as you, Craig missed my um, my complimentary and uh, Thank uh, God salvos of, of you know, re a good ongoing relationship with the governor's office as we figure out how to work towards uh, things we care about in education. So what I was recommending, you know, is let's do three steps and let's do them relatively quickly, um, meaning over the coming months. One uh, step is let's 
let's gather um, a lot of existing analysis, a lot of existing information about what's going on in school finance, what issues were risen, living proposal A, demographic enrollment, implication changes, et cetera, et cetera. Let's get all that in front of us. Let's gather what other states have done in terms of how they organize and finance schools as templates for our own thinking. And then let's begin to put some outlines together of what the major directions and issues that we want to attend to are as a vision and as a sort of outline of state board uh, approach to the nature of the changes that we want to advance. Um, and if, if we gather some resources from, uh, you know, Kresge, Skillman, or Kellogg, I would want to get uh, the folks who were here earlier who did the great start, you know, folks like that who are neutral, um, public sector or CRC or others to just help us facilitate this adding up and the discussion. If we don't, I don't want us to not do it, and I'm happy to make sure we come together and do it and do some of the work ourselves, myself, um, which we've done before. But I really think we should uh, advance this, this uh, look together as a board and see if we can come out with some, again, kind of vision direction pointing about the major issues, major uh, agendas that we want to see part of this. But obviously, it will be a broader discussion of how do we organize and fund our schools. And that we draw on, there is stuff that came out of the Oxford Foundation work that is and a contributor. There is stuff from many other directions that is an important contributor to this. And, and we ask the organizations to contribute their ideas, their analyses, and we invite them in and we wrestle with, uh, with what they have to say, different perspectives, and we try to put our own uh, sense of direction on it. So that's, that's my proposal. Cassandra. I'm really glad um, that we're talking about this and we're looking at doing this. I think it you know, we've been talking about it for a long time, and it's it's definitely something that we just need to do. I would like to recommend that maybe you assign a committee and we start making assignments that we can all um, start um, going out and doing bits and pieces of research and come back together um, and share what we've learned so that we can start developing this um, with or without the financing that comes with it. I think we need to just move forward and start doing the work. Um, so that would be my recommendation, and I'd be happy to serve if you so chose. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kathleen? I agree with Cassandra. I think there are people we can talk to in the community that we know and that are knowledgeable about school finance, and we should just do it because if we wait we can't just do it the way we did it last time. It didn't work. We have to do it ourselves. <laughs> and I'd be glad to do, do it, too, because I've been interested in this and working on this for many years. Thank you. Other discussion? Michelle, yeah. please. Um, I, uh, and I mentioned this in the uh, email yesterday, so the, I have um, some concern with the number one, uh, the, the bottom section where it's listed what groups constituency groups I think we should either um, make a more general statement um, or make a more inclusive uh, a broader net um, on some of these issues I think it's debatable um, some people may not see them as neutral and some people may and can, can I uh, just yeah. res respond by way of ex yeah. explanation um, when I was using the term neutral, it was uh, if there if there was anyone available to pay to facilitate any of this, it would be important that they be perceived as neutral, um, which would be of the character of a citizens research council and okay. public sector okay. consultants versus you know the the right or the left think tank. Um, and again, that that list uh, in the document was again meant to be illustrative, not exhaustive. I absolutely think okay. we would benefit by gathering the perspective recommendations analyses on this topic of which there's lots from all of our stakeholders so maybe, yeah. maybe to say that, that not you can say more generally I was or, trying to yeah, provide illustration as was stated here that this is included but not limited to something like that but I think it's also important to get parent groups um, that might uh, have some say on policy formation I don't know if the PTA of Michigan, or I'm not, you know, I'm not sure of all the groups that would be the that would be the best, but something that represents the interests and advocacy for parents' point of view, and of, and I think teachers' points of view, and other education professionals, um, 
Yeah, I work with the AFT and we work on policy issues all the time around K-12. Um, and I think local school boards. Um, uh, and because I think it gives a fuller picture of uh, what's happening on the, on the ground. And um, I think that in developing policy, it's important that their voice be. Just, uh, I, I typed at Alliance as an effort to capture all of their constituency groups, right. which includes most of the ones you named as, as examples of who all right. we need to draw on without right. listing them all. But right. I think your, 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 your recommendation is absolutely on. Okay. Thank you. So, John, did you want to name a committee then, or what were you? Um, what might be the I, I, I would be <laughs> delighted to, to name a committee. So let me. I, who who is not interested in actually being an assignment? What I was thinking, we could try to even um, yeah. do some work, and and then maybe have a couple work sessions this summer where we. Excuse me, ma'am. You're not allowed to just walk straight up there. <laughs> 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 we, we might convene some work sessions after we've got some stuff to work on a couple uh, over the months ahead too as, as for the whole board whoever can make it um, and try to make sure it's the time when people can do that. Is there anyone who doesn't want to be uh, either tasked for doing some work or an assignment or anything? I'd be, let me, I need to think about uh, you know, how to frame it and, and what, what to ask people to do, I guess. So, I'd be willing to serve okay. if you, if you need me. Okay. I should put some context. That's esteemed former board member, Marianne McGuire, <laughs> that I was joking with up here a little bit in case people are thinking, can you believe he called that woman out? <laughs> no. Welcome back, Marianne. Great to see your face. Dan, were you ready to? No. No? no. Good. Good. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. It, Thank you. It, and it looks like we can go to public participation because it looks like we have some now. Does that sound right? Go right to that. Go back. Well, let's do that first because you, you worked that out, Carol. So thank you. Why don't you make the introduction of our new Thank point. you, Mike. Um, we were talking a lot about students this morning. So um, the only new employee we have to introduce to you today is Kate Vaughn, who is a student assistant at the Library of Michigan. I'm asked her just to give us a short snippet of who she is and what she does. Hello, my name is Kate, and I attend Central. Um, I'm going actually for elementary education for science. Um, at the library, I do various tasks, um, mostly helping out all the employees. Um, I'm actually one of the head people for the statistics over there. Okay. Great. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. We could probably go straight to public participation then. Yep. Okay, I've got three forms for public participation, and if there are any more, I would be happy to have them. Um, I will let you know that, in, in case you were not aware or need a reminder, that we do five minutes of public participation, and the board typically does not um, engage in a discussion here at the board table regarding um, questions and answers, but you're certainly welcome to come to the table. Um, just sit right at the end there. If you have written things to uh, distribute, if you give them to one of the two people at the end, we'll distribute them around the table. So the first speaker is, Marianne, do you want to be the grand finale or the lead? I, I'd rather start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Marianne Yard McGuire will start. Um, she is the former state board member, so if Marianne, if you will come to the yeah, table. I'd like to bring Everyone with you? Okay, and then also Donovan Smith and Mayu Vang. Please come to the table. Okay, so can you come to the table. So thank you, and uh, I just want to say it's good to see you all again. I thought I'd be back sooner, but didn't work out. I'm having too much fun. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but we're here today um, because of um, some things related to the uh, Educational Achievement Authority in Detroit, uh, which is, um, as you all know, the, edu the uh, EAA. And uh, its partner, of course, the uh, emergency manager in Detroit, and together, they have 
closed uh, a great number of our schools and taken up other schools. And um, these are all schools that are uh, paid for with our tax dollars. Um, the, uh, there's been no um, advancement in achievement. In fact, the, uh, the gap between uh, Detroit students and the uh, rest of the students statewide has even uh, grown under um, the uh, Achievement Authority and the Emergency Manager. Um, in addition to all of this, um, we've got um, perspectives from uh, student backgrounds. And uh, with me here is Donovan Smith, who is a junior at Mumford High School, which is one of the high schools that's been taken into the EAA. Um, brand new school, I might add. And uh, he is a junior. His background is in graphic arts. He's got five years of uh, background in that and hopes to um, uh, have his own company uh, uh, after he graduates. So um, he is uh, going to talk about his experiences uh, throughout this past year <coughs> at uh, Mumford. Um, well, let me get to the chase. Um, I don't have a shot, but to make a long story well, short. Well, uh, can we start that, uh, start yeah, it over for him? <laughs> start the clock. Sorry. <laughs> no. There you go. Make it. Okay. No. Um, <laughs> well, I went to the AA, uh, Mumford High School. It was like the last resort choice. And um, when I got there, I was expecting a little bit more than what I was offered. Um, I'm not the best student, but I managed to keep my grades above failing uh, until I got into Mumford and my grades started to fall dramatically. It, um, I don't want to blame it all on the teachers, kind of mine, but most of it comes from not being pushed and not having the drive that I've had in my previous schools to want to do work. It's kind of like I come to class and nothing really happens. The teachers don't teach and it's just sitting there listening to rambunctious students just clowning and just being disruptive and it's hard to concentrate with that and um, the teachers are inexperienced, don't know how to handle the children and I find that to be a giant um, problem. Um, the way it's set up, it's kind of ridiculous. It's like um, the grades, it's really, it's um, scattered over the place. Some of the teachers don't know how to send in grades. Some of the teachers don't know how to grade people correctly. And some grades just don't get sent in. I can recall countless report cards I've received that has at least two or three of my classes missing a grade which causes my GPA to seem lower than it actually is. And in hindsight, that's a really big problem for me because when I get home and my mom sees I have like a 1.2 <laughs> on my report card, you can imagine that's not good news for me. Um, <laughs> but I, when I went to Mumford, I believe I was um, almost 3.0 student, maybe 2.9, 2.8. And this second report card marking, I went down to a 2.2. And then after that, my third report card marking, I went down to a 0.2, which is really bad. And I'm wondering how did this happen? And then I look at my report card and then I'm looking at how many teachers and how many classes I don't have grades on there. And then um, um, the grades I don't have. And so I'm pretty much just sitting in class, waiting to learn, not being taught anything I need to be taught. And I went in there kind of blind because I didn't have my transcripts and they still allowed me to go in. And so they're like, well, we'll let you in as long as we, um, we let you do, start you as like with ninth grade credits, unless you tell us what classes you had last year. 
And so I had to dig back in my mind and tell them what I had my 10th grade year. Some of them were, um, could have been wrong, so I ended up with geometry again and a couple of classes I already had. And then after I passed geometry, they're like, all right, we're going to send you to Algebra 2 in the middle of the semester. And I'm like, wait, what? And so I'm in, algebra, I'm in Algebra 2 now, blind, not knowing any of the material, which is causing my grades to suffer even more. And it's just, it's just really unfair. And I feel I should have a better teaching environment, better teachers to teach me, and for the EA to actually hold, hold and stand to what they said they were going to do. And the statement on the website, they said, individual learning and creative learning. And I can honestly say, not a single teacher has came to me and asked me, okay, we're going to, what works best for you? How can we build upon your skills to help you learn better? Not a single teacher has done that, and yet they said that the teacher will help individual students learn and build. With, and they said more creative ways of learning and more creative classes. We only have one art class, which is full, most of the semester around. And I'm an artist, and I wanted the art class, but it was too full. And then I look at people that have art class, and... They don't do art. They don't know how to draw. They just pretty much sit in there, slack off, and just talk all day. When I'm when there's an artist like me wanting art class, instead of taking time out of my classes um, and drawing, because it's a passion of mine. And honestly, we have subs almost every other day. There's teachers that will leave and leave us with subs, and the subs aren't teaching us anything. My Spanish teacher, she doesn't know how to put in grades. She a complete wreck and it's honestly really hindering to my learning process and honestly that's all I have to say about the EA and how it runs in my eyes and hindsight. Thank you. I, one thing I'd like to add is that um, th uh, there were other students in addition there was a press, re uh, press conference recently at uh, Mumford where a number of students talked about their experiences and non-experiences and um, they were scared to uh, to come here today for various reasons so I just wanted to add that so thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. our next speaker is Bayua Bang Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, that young man is about as brave a human being as I've ever met in my life. I told him not to come, and he chose to come. So that just says tremendously, um, uh, just tremendous amount about the kind of human being he is. So. I'm actually here because a parent asked me to come on her behalf. I would love to reveal her name, but she um, is afraid. And so her concerns are this. I'll, I'll just be very brief. Um, number one, the transcript issue and the grading issue as a young man just talked about in the EAA and in Mumford is um, disor disorganized and it's chaotic. She has a granddaughter who has grades that are, again, missing. And because the grades are missing, the transcript, the GPA is impacted. And because that's impacted, that's going to affect her when she tries to apply for scholarships. Um, additionally, because she does not have any real documentation of her grades, she cannot get into the federally funded Upward Bound program. There was an assembly on Upward Bound at Mumford High School. Half the students didn't know what that was about. And when they asked about that, the deadline passed. And so her granddaughter, this is a grandma, her granddaughter does not have the opportunity to take part in those kinds of college orientation types of programs. So that is a material injury that's done to that child because of a disorganized system. Her exact words were, the EAA was not ready to serve our students. And of course, um, I wish she was here but she's not. Another issue is college application and deadlines and all of that good stuff because our students don't have a transcript to show their exact credit count. They can't very well apply for FAFSA and, and all those things that get you ready for college. That's a huge, huge issue. So if we can please look into that, if we can please serve our students, really serve our students, that would be much, that would 
I wouldn't have to be here um, sitting and taking time out of my own schedule because a parent is too afraid to come and speak on her own behalf. Thank you. Thank you and thank much. you to the gentleman, the young man who presented as well. Are there any more public participation forms? Thank you. Thank Thanks you so much. much. The dean is at 1.30, so I think we can still um, skip over and go to could probably do Q. For some reason, I'm at a P is, Q is the P is state and federal legislation. Q is the communications and travel policy. Q does come here for P, doesn't it? I don't know why I'm going backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do that. That would be great. John, did you want to? So you, you, you all got the communications policies and travel policies that came out of our planning meeting, non-retreat discussion. <laughs> so, and I think they they were pretty straightforwardly what we discussed. I think rather happily at that meeting uh, that um, board members uh, will uh, communicate through uh, this MDE functionality when we have a shared uh, policy position uh, and similarly with uh, with any education uh, stakeholder groups um, individuals or groups of board members would be free and then would be assisted in receiving access to lists and information of media and elected officials if their uh, communications editorials letters op-eds uh, uh, are clearly labeled as uh, the positions of um, individual or, or individual board members acting together and uh, on the right uh, kind of um, letterhead or logos that identified same. So I think that was uh, the communications policy and the travel policy, I guess, uh, pretty straightforward. And you all had a chance to look at it that uh, we'd all uh, have an, a bit of allocation with priorities that we choose but and re any remaining left would be divided equally so I guess I ask for your approval of the communications and travel policies as drafted motion John yeah moved by John supported by Dan no, no, or, somebody else I did, think I support supported by Michelle mm -hmm. discussion Dan please. yeah uh, two quick questions <coughs> one is um, the third bullet second paragraph uh, which which one are you in? Uh, I'm sorry, on um, the communications one. Okay. Um, on any viewpoint shared that have not been voted on by a majority of the board, the following disclaimer should be included. Um, a quick question is, uh, so that language would include committee statements, um, like the one that we just did around the, um, what was it that we HB sent? HB 4813? Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure that that's right. I don't think we actually talked about com committees and how Kind of committee communication. I just want to make sure that that gets lifted up, and we figure out if that's if that's if we want to do that. Have that same language included when a committee is making a statement. Discussion on that. Well, I think um, for a committee, what we did in this case was just clearly label it a statement by the State Board of Education Legislative Committee, and at the very end, we put who the members of the legislative committee are. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know that this particular quote here um, is necessarily something I would recommend for a committee statement, but I would recommend that a committee statement clearly identify that this is a committee, um, uh, operation of a committee as opposed to the full State Board of Education. That would be my recommendation. Yeah, we could have a separate, a separate bullet for that. Yeah, I, 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 I like that recommendation. I do think it is a, it is an official position of a committee that mm -hmm. we've empowered, and as long as it's uh, not misrepresenting to be the whole board's position, um, I, I like your articulation. I, I appreciate Dan bringing it up. So we could yeah. add a bullet to that effect, and that would satisfy and at least clarify for us as we're, we're implementing this. Could Kathleen? we indicate that that, that, that would only be done in time, time when it's necessary time to meet deadlines or something to meet legislative schedules or something so we just don't have committees going off making statements by themselves all the time it would, this is this was because they're meeting today to do something we wanted to get our yeah mm -hmm. we could start the bullet with something like in in the unusual event when timing requires mm -hmm. yeah. blah 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 something, something like right. that and 
but it would be a separate bullet and wouldn't wouldn't necessarily have to have wouldn't have that other language. Uh, I guess, and this is getting down into the weeds too much, but we have other committees too, that the health committee, I don't want to preclude them from sending out something on from the health committee, which has nothing to do with, you know, meeting the deadline or whatever. Mm. I mean, I think it's a healthy thing to have communication from the committee, communications from individual groups of board members and communications from the full board. I just, I guess, Kathy, my response would be, we know that is our expectation and that's pretty, I don't, I don't know if we need to write that down. I mean, we're not going to have committees going off half-cocked. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Not with this fully cocked board that we have. Right. right. But you never know. Yeah, things change. But from what Art's wife told me, if we had that board back. So, hey, careful. Wow. Kathy was on. I think Marianne might have been on that Well, board. no. They, she didn't actually make oh, I thought that was longer ago. Um, Art was just, he was still superintendent when I was elected. Eileen was here. Okay. Well, I withdraw my comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what? Uh, sorry. Please. Just quick thought on that. Um, I'm struck by the notion that that's something that we could manage if it became a problem, or that the board could manage if it became a problem. Um, I don't know if it will or won't, right? I mean, so none of us knows. And the attorney in me says, we'll put language in there now. That, but, <laughs> um, uh, but it can always be added. Um, and my sense about policy making is that you're better off starting off with uh, kind of broad brush strokes and then adding detail later only as necessary because eventually you get so many weeds growing and you know that it gets cumbersome and in the way and it doesn't serve anymore. So my gut would be, I mean, I, I just thought it was important that we distinguish between committees and um, other instances. So, my, I, so I like the language that Cassandra suggested. My gut would be that maybe we hold off on the urgency allowing a, community, a committee to do that until, we, until it actually, like if it starts to become a problem or have it, then we could shut it down. Um, that's just my gut. I don't know. I, and I like I said, the lawyer in me says that you're absolutely right. Yeah, I just, me too. Uh, yeah. I'm not a lawyer, but um, I do believe that you have to specify it because so you don't run into problems later. It's too late after the problem occurs and they, oh, so wait a minute, we're going to have to put this in because Kathy did whatever. Now, <laughs> uh, or anyone, you know, anyone. You're more likely me. The committee of Ken. Right. Right. Yeah, John, well, any committee. John. But John. also, John said that, that the committees are empowered by, by the board. board. So therefore, then the committees are speaking for the board if we empower the committee. They're speaking for us. They're speaking for me, as far as I'm concerned, because we empowered them to act in our behalf. What if we just put a footnote at the bottom and just said, you know, left it and just put a footnote that this will only happen in extenuating circumstances when the board can't meet or it or something like uh, something uh, generic issues of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it wouldn't necessarily be in the text, but there's just a little note at the I bottom. Agree. I'd appreciate okay, that. Michelle, you convinced me. I'm okay. okay. Yeah, okay. We need okay. the rough cut, so pay no attention yeah, to whatever Craig is releasing about <laughs> it. <laughs> because everyone can do it individually. <laughs> Anyway, right? So there's yeah. really no need for a, a committee to rush in any but the most exigent circumstance. So, yeah, right, fair. But it would it, that language would be helpful in the sense that then when we're implementing it, we wouldn't use the same language, but we would do what we kind of did yesterday, or yeah, yesterday with the legislative committee. We're good with that. You guys hear it? Okay. Just one point of clarification. Yes, and when we talk about committees, we're talking about those that have been created by the board itself and not any self-anointed caucus or anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Self-anointed caucus would be stuck with uh, point number or bullet number two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we Did would and remember? we would probably term it such. Okay. Self-anointed. <laughs> the unholy alliances <laughs> that emerged. Oh we that saw you and one. you and Dan coming in together. We thought maybe we got a <laughs> we got an unholy alliance going here now. <laughs> <laughs> Tardy party. Richard. Yes. Uh, two other quick. I'm sorry, but I think these things are important. Okay. Two other quick things. Uh, one is um, the communications doesn't. Uh, so it appears to 
um, apply primarily to public statements through the media. Um, and I just want to clarify that we're not um, limiting the ability of the department through this to provide statements to the legislature, whether that is a committee statement or a full board statement. This is not a communicate with the legislature policy. Is that right? I thought it was both. Yeah, it, 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 it does allow us to send the same information to the legislature. To the legislature. I think yeah, we'd, always want, we'd always want we'd always want advice on what the intent goal. is. It might be that there's a given yes. statement that an individual board member has. It, 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 makes, it makes the same discrimination as the media, meaning if it's a shared <laughs> policy position, it can be sent by the department as the board's position. If it is a caucus or an individual, then uh, legislators are part of the elected officials that the, the mm -hmm. department would provide lists to, and the members yeah, would be responsible for sending it out. My okay. okay, last question, and that is on the travel policy. Um, so I th there's a um, kind of a slice off the top before it gets divided among the members, um, and I'm just not clear on what that slice is for. It's for, it obviously says, um, uh, per diem and travel reimbursements. Um, but I want to be, that's not all travel reimbursements, right? If I just decide to run off to a conference that I feel like supports my role here, you know, I shouldn't be able to submit for that and get that taken off the top. So. I just want to be clear about what it is that we're taking off the top. It's per diem and travel reimbursements for... NASB it was like NASB stuff, right? There was a limited amount it was not, of stuff. It was, right. I, I, what thinking. we heard in the discussion was NASB. The NASB rep, I thought you were inferring, is carrying on duties for you, so that should right. come off the top for that one conference, conference as we understood it. But, but wouldn't the travel reimbursements refer to the routine board business travel in state that we all do that we submit for and then well, the nas know. the second thing is the nasb priority for the nasb out of state mm -hmm. I i'm just guessing i wasn't part of this one but yeah. so do we want to say then so per diem and travel reimbursements for nasb business for the nasb delegates official nasb stuff and for Official state board meetings that folks travel to. Doesn't it? Isn't that what this says? Yeah. Priority will be given to travel related to state board of education meetings, NASB delegate travel to the national mm -hmm. conference, and NASB orientation for new board members. Uh, so that's supposed to be. Well, then maybe we can just make that all part of the first paragraph, and then maybe my confusion goes away. If that's okay. clearly tied to. The I amend my motion to make the changes we discussed. Mm -hmm. Is that support still in place? I was no. I was going yeah. to ask if in the, in the NASB delegate travel to the national conference, I was thinking maybe we should put in that and, and the legislative conference, the NASB legislative conference. Oh, okay. yeah, because that's important, too. But I don't know if you but, want to do that. Uh, well, of the board, Richard. Well, and related is uh, this, this year I volunteered for a study group for NASB. And if I had to pay for, if I had to pay to attend the three meetings myself, I would think twice. Uh, so, and and I understand that that is not. Uh, I mean, it, the board has to decide priorities, and so if, if we're going to include the legislative meeting, I guess I'd I'd want you know, this volunteer point. work to be included or considered. Yeah, you you could run this down to zero before you divided it up. <laughs> That's but, right. But it's also true. I was on the uh, political. Affairs Committee, and I could never make any meetings, but had I been able to do that, it would have been at, at considerable expense. Yeah. So we Should just we have to decide what, how, what, how many ways we have So let's just limit it to the system. National Conference, for, and then, you know, it gets divided eight ways, and ideally there's enough funds in there to go to study group or legislative conference or whatever it is that people feel like is important. And the new member orientation. And then we want to send the new That's members. already there, yeah. yeah. So we're good with that? Yeah. That's a motion and a support? I, I can live with it as written, yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Good. And Dean Ball, we're, we're right on time with you here. <laughs> Yes, sir. My apologies, but I have a commitment. And she's the most oh, yeah. I know. Today. Yeah, I have the pleasure of introducing Dean Ball last okay. week. Tell, tell me how smart she is. God. Um, <laughs> You're kind of but a anyway, rate. I had So before I knew about this thing, I had a, you know, so maybe in 40 minutes I'll sneak out. No offense, please. <laughs> <laughs>
Minutes. Oh, you mean for when you leave, we would understand. You don't yeah. mean you're leaving. Now. <laughs> yeah. It's not that you're walking out on the dean. We. Yeah, is it, I'm walking out on you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Could you report that, please? Get that in. New governor advisor walks out on state superintendent. In a rough. That'll actually help, probably, <laughs> in a perverse way. Won't go any further there. <laughs> uh, dean, certainly welcome. We're so happy to have you with us today and appreciate your taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here and we're, we're looking forward to it. And I don't, do you have colleagues that you'd like um, to, to yes. join? Uh, I would meet Catherine Taylor who works with me at the um, School of Education at the University of Michigan who's been providing me support throughout this uh, task over the last <laughs> uh, months. So. And uh, Joseph Martineau who's a member of the council is here. Yes, and you met here recently. I had a chance to pop in and really yeah. appreciate your leadership yes. on it. Very, uh, very thoughtful and, and probably not rewarded enough. So that's one reason I think John and the board were hoping to get you to come here today and with a status report and as you see fit. Yeah, so I haven't had an opportunity to address you before, so good afternoon. I'm really honored to have been asked to come here. Can you hear me fine? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, thought that I would, what I would do is just try to orient you to the charge and what we're up to and what we've been doing, give you a sense of where we are, and then leave plenty of time for you to ask me questions. We're in the home stretch, um, and obviously there's some aspects of where we are that I won't be able to talk about today, but I should be able to give you a pretty good sense about the way this is coming out. Um, I actually wanted to start by, first of all, focusing you on the title, which is that a central principle of the council has been to use the mandate of the legislation to build what we consider to be an improvement-focused oriented system. And I'm going to try to detail for you what that means and what that will require of us as a state if we were to realize that goal. Um, and to do that, I actually wanted to start with uh, a, an op-ed piece that some of you have heard me talk about before, but I think is worth going back to, and it was one that appeared in the New York Times last fall. Uh, Nicholas Kristof, who often writes about education, I don't always agree with everything he says, but in this case, thank you. Um, he wrote this very strong op-ed piece that began with a quote that I included on the slide in which he argued that um, the most important civil rights battleground today is education, and likewise the most crucial struggle against poverty is the one fought in schools. And if you missed this piece, I urge you to go back and look at it because as a scholar of schooling, I find useful in his article that he compiled um, the best, uh, or at least a good sampling of the best social science research that produced findings that I find inspiring and humbling. The inspiring part is that he compiled the research that shows that teacher effects are large. By that I mean that the effect of a skillful teacher on a child's life chances and progress, nothing short of that, is dramatic. So a way to understand that would be, and he goes on to sort of translate these studies into understandable bite sizes. He says things like, if you're a child who gets a teacher whose performance is in the you know, bottom couple of percentiles of the distribution of skill, never mind for the moment what that is, because that's what we're going to talk about today. That child, if you're that child, it is as though at the end of the school year you've lost something like four months of instruction. I, what I like about this is that when you see things like a statistical effect sizes, it's very hard to understand what they mean. And when he translates them in those ways, you see like that is a very, very big deal. Um, and he says similarly that, you know, for example, if you get a teacher who's in the top, say, quintile of teacher's skill, it is as though similarly you gain something like three to four months of instruction. So these are non-trivial effect sizes. And a further thing to appreciate about these studies is that what they're showing us is that we all have theories about what explains children's learning across a school year, and if I asked you, you would name a lot of them. Everyone can, whether the kid comes to school, whether the child is well-fed, whether the parents are involved, and lots of things that we think are important, but what these studies do is they compare different factors in explaining variation in kids' achievement, and what they show over and over is that skillful teaching has the most powerful effect at explaining variation in achievement. I, as a teacher and as a teacher educator and as someone involved with educator evaluation, find that, I, as I said earlier, inspiring because what that suggests to me is that efforts to improve the quality of teaching are, as Christoph argues, a civil rights issue. They are a way to ensure that all children are getting skilled teaching and we are, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, quite far from that in this country. 
Krista does something in the op-ed that I fundamentally disagree with, and that is that after doing this nice job of summarizing the research, which I commend to you, he says, so clearly this is the problem we have to solve is we have to find those really weak teachers and get them out of the classroom. I think he's wrong. That's not a very difficult task, and we're talking about a small fraction, even he says that. What's actually the problem for us is to figure out what those teachers are doing who are adding so much value to kids' experience in school. What are those top quintile teachers doing? What are their skills? What are the things that they do every day in the classroom? That's what we're not doing as a country. And furthermore, after we know what those things are, we will have to help people learn to do them. We will have to help people learn to do them, and Christoph doesn't seem to understand that. So what that means, and I think what inspires the council's work, is that we need to figure out what highly skilled teaching is, and we need to make sure that a very large number of adults knows how to do that. Because in fact, I think you know, teaching is the largest workforce in the country. You don't get to skilled teaching for every child in this country, or in this state, or in Detroit, or whatever place you want to name. You don't get there just by going out and searching for people who know how to do that. That just simply will never work, because we need so many people to do this work well. So we took the opportunity to build and to recommend an educator evaluation system as an opportunity for the state of Michigan to lead in this respect, to be a state that would get it, that skilled teaching matters, and that what we most need to do is to find a way to improve the quality of teaching at scale in a state the size of Michigan. That's what we took to be our <coughs> mandate. Just because I'd like to have a little fun with you, I'm going to do something um, just to make you understand, if you don't already, that what I mean by skillful teaching is something that you do not walk off the street knowing how to do. I'm going to put you in that position. And some of you have lived through this with me before, so you can hold back a little bit. But I could actually ask you to do something real, like get up right now and lead a discussion of 30 uh, first graders. And except for those of you who have done that for most of your career, you would fail at it miserably. And you wouldn't do any better if I offered to pay you a lot of money, by the way. Just if I said, okay, you know you can make a million dollars if you lead this discussion well, you won't be able to do it. Or if I said, here's a child who's having trouble learning to read, could you quickly figure out what it is the most likely cause of the difficulty this child is having just because you can read doesn't mean that you would have any idea how to figure that out easily. So we're talking about real practices that good teachers learn to do that make a difference for kids learning and that being really smart or really well educated or a really good business person or any number of other competent things does not get you into being able to do that with kids. So I'm going to give you a relatively simple example of that just to show you what I mean. And the example I want to use is to show you the difference between being able to do math and knowing it well enough to teach it to somebody else. Now, to be clear in this example, I'm not asking you to try to teach it or try to explain it to child or anything like that. I'm only asking you whether you know the math well enough. Okay? Now, I'm not, I wouldn't pretend to ask you right now to teach this math. I just want to know if you know it well enough. So before I show you the example, I would like you on a, just a scrap of paper to multiply 49 times 25 and get the answer to that. 49, 49 times 25. 25. The gallery can do that too. <laughs> Some of them are going to have real trouble, I think. <laughs> so what's the answer? Maybe I'll call on the superintendent of public. <laughs> 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 1225? 1225. I just used a technique called cold call, which is you call on a student when the student isn't expecting, and there are some actually important reasons when you would use that. So that goes in the bucket of how do you learn to actually get a group of people to discuss something, and when do you do what kind of method to get them to talk. So thank you for providing that answer. And if we were really having a discussion, I would ask whether other people agreed, and I'd ask you how they got the answer. We'll skip that part. <laughs> so now we agree that the answer is 1225. But now I'm going to have you look at three answers to this problem that are not 1225. And the reason I'm showing you these is because if you were actually going to teach third or fourth grade, you would need to be so fluent with understanding this that if you saw an answer that was not 1225, you would quickly be able to detect what the mathematical steps were that someone took to get the wrong answer so that you would be in a position to begin intervening and helping the person, in this case a child, to learn how to do it correctly. If all you know is, oh, that's not 1225, that's a little bit like being a physician who when a sick person comes into the office says, you seem to be sick. 
I'm not trying to make the comparison that children who aren't learning are sick, but the <laughs> lack of being able to diagnose is my point. A, t a physician who can only identify that the person has a problem, hasn't done anything to diagnose it. So if you're a teacher, you actually need skills of diagnosis, and skills of diagnosis depend on a kind of knowledge of the subject that is pretty different than just being good at it yourself. So here are the three wrong answers. Whoops. I would like you, as quickly as you can, to ascertain what mathematical steps produce those wrong answers. Well, they multiplied wrong. Yeah, I think they multiplied <laughs> wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's if all you know that there is that they're wrong, it doesn't put you in particularly good stead. You don't really know the math well enough in that case. How did I get a hundred? They're not aligning them. Well, they multiply. Yeah. How wildly different. I'm an ex officio That's member, so I don't get to participate. <laughs> 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 you probably, like, get the pressure off of you right now, Craig. Okay? He's new to the school. <laughs> you're you're, you're thinking about his school to call on you. Huh? <laughs> But we don't want to take a lot of time with this because you really want to hear about educator evaluation. And besides which, my point here, in fact, is that to know the math well enough to teach it, you can't take lots of minutes to figure it out. Because if you have a child in front of you who does something, you actually pretty quickly have to have a good guess about what might be going on so that you can ask a question or decide what you might do next. So would anybody like to comment on any of these? Yes. Which one would you like to comment on? On C. Okay. It seems that the child um, did 50 times 25 for the first answer, and then instead of subtracting a 25, added a 25. Oh, and why might somebody uh -huh. add the 25 instead of subtracting it? Confusing the, uh, the analog, uh, the procedure. Norm normally when you see this, you're adding your, uh, uh, your sums, and um, so it's used the... Uh, wrote yeah. it wrong in the right the Yeah, so you writing. are used to the algorithm where you would yeah. add together the partial sums and get an answer. Yeah. The other possibility, that's quite good. The other possibility <laughs> is that the person thinks well 49 is less than 50, and so you have to go up to get to 50, and so you would also similarly go up. But that was a, you did a great job of that. We'll take time for one more. Does anyone want to venture into either of the other ones? Let me just stop for a minute. How many people in the room think that they could explain A and B? Anybody? A and B. Well, they, forgot a and to, B. they forgot to add the, the So my point right now is if you notice, this is a room full of very capable people. I don't know who you all are, but I... Charge of education. This is you, can't, you don't know this math well enough to answer this question. The reason I'm showing you this right now is because when we say we want to produce skilled teaching at scale, we mean things as mundane as this, like actually knowing the content well enough to, to teach it to someone else. And that is different than being able to do the content. And this, I picked this because it's like the most basic of examples. Oh, thanks. We're not yet talking to you. <laughs> well, can you run a discussion or can you talk to parents productively or can you diagnose kids' reading difficulties or can you tell them the textbook is wrong and you need to modify it? Those are the things you really have to do to be skilled. But you also have to know your content well enough. So I like this example because it pushes smart people to realize like there's a little more to it than what we sometimes think. So I'll just tell you one of them. So the first one, A, does someone want to do A? They, they didn't okay, know Kathleen? before. I got what? B. Yeah, I got B too. I Can you explain that, yeah. Kathleen? Well, B, I think, is 25 times 9 and then 25 Now I have an times. unruly class where people are talking about different problems at the same time. <laughs> Go ahead, <laughs> Mr. Superintendent. What are you saying about B? Well, I, I mean, from the student's point of view, it was 25 times 9 and then add. Yeah. 25 times 4, and somehow in their head. And what's get, wrong with that? Oh, nothing from my point of view. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, most of it is right, because yeah. you can yeah. multiply upside down. Yeah. Multiplication is commutative, so it's fine to go 25 times 9. And so what went wrong with this? Because the answer is not 325. What went wrong, Dan? Well, they didn't add the extra place, the extra zero on the... Yeah, right, and probably if I push Dan on that, he could explain that really what he means to be saying is that 25 times 40, 40. is 1,000, mm -hmm. and not 20. it's not really 25 times 4. Mm -hmm. So, and the first one, many people think is 9 times 5 is 45, and that the child may have written 40, 
and didn't carry, that's actually probably not what happened. Probably it's nine times five is 45. You do carry the four. But if you add that four to the four in the 40, right uh, away you have eight, and eight times five is 40. Similarly, nine times two is 18. If you carry the one and add the one to the four, then you have five times two is 10. And we, you know that you're not supposed to add the carry in right away, but it's perfectly reasonable that a child would yeah. try to do that because when you add multi-digit numbers, you do add the carry in whatever you want. So this was a long example. Thank you very much. We'll be going to the next <laughs> item now. <laughs> <laughs> but again, my Sorry. purpose of showing this is to get back to something a little later, which is just like telling a child you got the answer wrong and then thinking the child will learn doesn't work, it also won't work to simply say to teachers, you're underperforming, now get better. So I want to come back to that a little bit later. So we want to make skillful teaching common in the state, not something unusual. Most people, if you ask them how many times do you have a highly skilled teacher, they tell you, oh, my high school English teacher was amazing. But most people can't name lots of teachers whom they felt were good. And that is not because we have the wrong people. That is because we do not have a system that helps to support skillful work. And the two things that we really need that educator evaluation could help us get are evidence-based systems that provide feedback for improvement, actually useful feedback. So useful feedback isn't you are an underperforming teacher. Useful feedback is the way that you organize whole group discussions makes it really difficult for most of your learners to track on what's happening because of the way you're using the board, as an example. The second thing is, and it goes with my first point, you would have to have targeted professional training that's focused on things that are the highest leverage practices of teaching, like leading a discussion or diagnosing difficulties. And you would also need opportunities to learn content in a way that you need it for skilled instruction. So it doesn't matter how many requirements we all make for how much content people have to study. If it's not about content they're going to be able to use when they teach children, it won't help very much. You could require all the coursework you want in the world at whatever university or other place you want. Unless they learn how you explain it, multiple ways to represent it, they probably won't be in a very good position to make content available to kids. And you could say the same about diagnosing reading difficulties, dealing with the poem, managing small group work, modifying textbooks, writing assessments, using data, all of that. So evaluation is key to this because there really is evidence that skillful teaching, as I told you, has impact on kids' learning and we need a more systematic way. But there are a lot of challenges here that the council, now I'm going to get closely to our work, what the challenges are. The first is that the more we learned over the last 18 months made us worry that if we recommend a system that in the end emphasizes compliance over usefulness, we won't get where we want to be. And it would be very easy to recommend a whole set of systems that are bureaucratic in nature and seek compliance from everyone, and then all the efforts will go to compliance, when actually what we want is better learning for children. And I will illustrate that for you in a bit. Yes. The second is because teaching isn't a field in which there's a highly developed shared professional language for distinguishing different aspects of the work. It's very easy to have highly capricious and subjective kinds of feedback. So right now I could show you a video, which I won't do, because we've already taken enough time testing you today. But I could show you a video and ask you to decide without any guidance which, whether you think the teaching is extremely skillful, OK, not very good, or really desperately terrible. And I guarantee you the room would split four ways because we don't actually have highly developed on our own systems for looking at teaching. You might doubt me on that, and I can show it you some other time, but that's what we're struggling with is how do you put enough structure in place so that anyone who comes into a classroom can give useful, reliable feedback that's actually specific enough to be helpful and isn't all dependent on whatever that person happens to care to pay attention to with whatever terms they use. Okay, So that's very different in other fields. when surgeons in our medical school talk about practice and watch one another, they actually have language for the techniques they're using and can reliably give one another feedback. We're trying to build something that teaching hasn't really had. So just to remind you, and we don't have to deal with this for long because I think you know this part. This started in two years ago now. We were appointed as a council in September. The legislature appropriated funding in December. We really began our work in earnest in January of 2012, and I think you know that our first task was to persuade many people that we weren't going to write this thing in 90 days. So here we are back two years later. We are ready to make recommendations. 
we will expire as a commission in about two weeks. So actually, the train really is coming to the end at this point. You know, I think, who the people are. I want to commend everyone who was involved in structuring this committee in a way that most states didn't, and that is to put a very small number of people on a committee who actually represented the expertise that was required. And at one point, when someone questioned why there were no practicing teachers, we counted the years of public school teaching experience among us and came up with 47 years of public school teaching experience. So while nobody currently teaches on this council, this is a group of people who has been both observed by principals, that includes principals who have done it, and people who have struggled to help ch children learn. So I do not accept that there wasn't expertise in that. But there was additionally expertise in measurement, in testing, in teacher observation, and the like. That, and I applaud you and everyone else involved for that. <clears throat> Our charge was this, to recommend these five things. I'm going to talk to you primarily about uh, number one and two, and I'm happy to answer questions about uh, three, four, and five. We wrote a vision for ourselves very early that you've probably seen, but the highlighted terms are very important to us and have continued to be very important. We're attempting to come in with a set of recommendations that are fair to everyone involved, that are easily comprehensible, and that they're doable. Doable includes everything from affordable to can be done in schools as we currently have them. So I'll say a little bit about that in a moment. But we were juggling all the time how much money will there be? How much time is there for this? How could it be done in ways that are actually fair and not, as I said earlier, capricious? We referred to everything we could find about rigorous standards for doing this properly, whether it's testing or teacher observation or combining scores or any of those things. And we kept in front of us that our goal was to improve instruction, student learning, and the professional learning of the educators in the state. So that's what we attempted to do, and we kept coming back to this. There's at least six challenges, and uh, I want to just make sure you keep them in your mind as you hear me today and talk to me about it, and also when you read our report. So I've already talked about number one several times. Number two and three are very important. So by tools here, I'm talking about observation tools. We needed to provide guidance to principals and others who would observe classroom teaching in ways that would be valid, fair, and feasible. So for example, you need a tool that you can get training on and then 50 different people or 500 different people can go into classrooms and use in pretty comparable ways. If you have something where, depending on the observer, you get completely different observational feedback that's of no use whatsoever. So we were looking to find ones that could be people with training could learn to do them reliably. Student achievement is a huge bucket of sets of issues, and I will say a little bit more of that in a moment, but that has to be done similarly fairly and validly. We worried about spending resources uh, wisely. Money is not unlimited in the state, but we don't only mean money, we also mean time and attention. So there's a lot of stuff to pay attention to in public schooling, a lot of things about student learning. If all the attention and all the time gets spent on teacher evaluation, frankly, we won't get where we want to be because not enough time will be spent on teaching or improving instruction or teacher learning. Infrastructure is going to matter a lot. That includes everything from training for principals to datum systems for keeping track of what's generated out of the system and some methods that are not excessively um, Byzantine that can assure quality control across the school districts and schools in the state. And, you know, we're facing challenges, as you well know, of establishing a system, something systematic, in an era where both standards and assessments are in flux in the state. So we all know the discussion about the Common Core or any other number of ideas about what the standards are for student learning, but there have to be common standards for student learning or there can't be a system of teacher evaluation. And we have to have assessments that are fair and reliable and we have to have them in lots of grades and for subjects we don't have in order to do this. And that's all, you know, all under discussion right now. So we're doing our best to come in with something that can weather the tides of that flux that we see in the state. I think you know that we conducted a pilot. That was after we succeeded in persuading everyone that we couldn't do it in 90 days. And the pilot has been super useful to us. The purposes included just trying to learn more about the things we had questions about. I'm not going to go over all this because I think you know about it. But it also enabled us to comply with our application for a federal ESEA waiver so that we could actually have the time to come in with defensible recommendations. The pilot involved our piloting four particular systems of teacher observation in 14 districts. 
we gave training, we installed testing that doesn't currently exist in these districts, and we did a number of other things and that enabled us to learn more so that we could make recommendations. The pilot study enabled us to learn all these kinds of things, like how this really works in a real school setting. It enabled us to get feedback from teachers and school leaders. We could try how reliable different systems were of observing or of measuring student growth, figure out something about the resources involved, you know, how well does it work in different settings to you know, use the computer-based tools, or how will data be stored, uh, and get information that would help us develop recommendations about our fifth charge, which had to do with quote, waivers, or what if districts want to do something that's very different than what the state recommends. In case you didn't see this, here are the districts who participated in the pilot. When we show this, and the, and the particular observation tools, some of you are familiar with these and some of you may not be, but these are four tools we chose after considerable research around the country about which seemed to us to be the most robust and worth piloting. I'm really grateful, as my colleagues are, that these districts participated. We've learned an enormous amount. The study was conducted by the Institute for Social Research, an independent firm from us, but they've given us feedback and updates all year long about what they're learning on the ground from teachers, from principals, from the effort to try to do this. Every district that participated was using a tool it wasn't familiar with <coughs> so that we had a chance to learn what's the learning like. Um, you'll see that it underrepresents our big urban districts. Um, we only could select schools that volunteered to participate and, or districts that uh, volunteered, so we selected from those. This isn't a representative sample of Michigan. It does represent the fact that we do have lots of small districts in this state. That is something we're representing, but it was a whole lot better than doing no pilot. We don't claim to make generalizations from this, but we learned a lot that I think would put us in much better stead than w have we done it without. We had a set of design principles overall that are, I think, familiar from everything else I've said. We had design principles for the observation tools as well. I'd like to call your attention, actually, to a couple of things on this slide. One is uh, that the tool has to be aligned with the national standards. A second about it being aligned to improvement. So you could look at two different tools and one would simply tell a teacher you're not doing this specific thing well, whereas another tool says this is the thing you're not doing well, and those are different, and we look for ones that give specific kinds of feedback. It's really important that the demands be feasible, and this is a, not a minor point. So one thing we learned, for example, probably won't surprise you, is you get much more reliable estimates of the teacher's skillfulness the more often the teacher is observed. The less often the teacher is observed, the less reliable is your prediction, because you know, if you come to my classroom on one day and it happens I'm teaching something that I haven't taught before, it's actually really difficult and my, I misjudged what my children brought to it, or a lot of them are sick and absent, or who knows what, you get one impression of my teaching, but if you come three times, you get a much more reliable <laughs> estimate of what my teaching is like. So the more the better, there's a limit to that, but three to four is really, really good. We can't recommend that principals in this state are going to observe every one of their teachers three to four times, so that presents a conundrum of how we get reliable enough observational data without making the thing just break its back. So that's an example of what we mean by feasibility, and we have to struggle with that in our recommendations. On student growth, um, there are many problems here, but among others, we need a way to deal with the fact that there are many subjects and many grade levels at which we don't provide state-centered tools for measuring student growth. So although it sounds nice in the sort of surface-level discourse to say we're going to measure growth of all the students, it varies terrifically whether we actually provide any systematic tools for measuring that. And it's very important to understand that what this is about is not just measuring and learning, which is what a lot of people think it is. That sounds like what we mean. Because this is about teacher evaluation or principal evaluation, what we're trying to do is associate instruction. What part of student learning can be attributed to the instruction? There are other things that account for kids' changes in kids' learning. For example, if a child moves many times during the year, that is going to have something to do with whether the child learns. If it keeps changing curriculum and keeps changing settings, the child is out a great deal. This goes back to where I started today when I talked to you about teacher effect. So, when we look at student growth, it has to be fairly associatable with teaching. But it's more complicated than that. For example, when I was a full-time teacher, 
I, and I taught in East Lansing Public Schools with many children who didn't speak English as their first language. My children were taught by at least, taught English language arts by at least three different people. Me, someone who helped them with developing their English skills as they were English language learners, and someone who worked with them on reading difficulties. And all of us were contributing to their reading growth. It's not a simple proposition to say which of one of us contributed what proportion of their learning of reading that year, even if they were in school every day all year and didn't move. So, uh, and I could go on and on. If you're uh, teaching, you know, industrial arts, it's different than if you're teaching French or you're teaching math about what it is to measure growth. So we had to explore ways to find equipment that could help educators reliably and in a more disciplined way account for student learning, even in some of these conditions. So in the end, the recommendations of what we're building are we're striving to have them maintain our commitments to this. We're seeking to recommend something back that we think has the highest probability of moving the needle on the feedback that teachers get and ultimately the learning that our students do. We're trying hard, and this is, I think, the hardest central piece that you'll see in our report, is how to balance uh, building local capacity, since we do have big variation in the state about districts and schools and educators, and in the end, this actually has to be something districts are capable of doing. However, to get there, we also want things that are central, that the state pays for on one hand, but also says are essential on another, both of those things. And we do want, that's what we were asked to provide, was a way for Michigan to have a system, not for every district to build its own system. We actually know that if every district builds its own system, it won't be fair, it won't be reliable, it won't be valid. It's very hard to build these things on one's own. So in fact, many districts will have to do things in common. But if everything is centralized, it will A, cost too much, and B, go back to what I said at the beginning about being compliance oriented. So we want to maximize the cost-benefit ratio such that the resources are more spent on improvement than on regulation of everything. But that's a balancing act, because without some regulation, we'll have what we have now. So that's the tension. The timeline is roughly this. We will be finish finalizing our report in the next couple of weeks, we will get some external reviews so that when you and everyone else to whom we submit it reads it, you'll know that not only did we consult with people around the state and around the country over and over, but we asked people to review our final report so that you have some assurance of quality uh, and it isn't just you know the six of us and we say that we're experts, but that others who know a lot have reviewed it and have said that what we've come up with balances the challenge as well. What we hope then, and this is less in our control, is that uh, the legislature will act swiftly in the fall to turn our recommendations into implementable uh, policy and that during the coming school year, schools and districts will be, be able to begin focusing on the necessary training as well as you know, competing for bids from vendors to get the tools in place in the state that we will be able to launch in a staged manner the educator evaluation system <coughs> that we hope. Uh, in the following school year. That's still a very ambitious timeline, and note that it is different than other legislation that's already in place that declares that every school district will have a defensible system now. These things are run, two trains running on different tracks, but if you buy the vision that we're about, then it is very important to get this timeline aligned in the state so that the messages that we're sending to schools, to educators, are actually more consistent. If we do that, I actually, my co colleagues and I think feel confident that Michigan could build a system that's better than most of the states we looked at, maybe all of them. But it will really take a concerted, I think, across the aisle effort to make this work. Um, and we really hope that you, um, in your role, will, will help to support that. And I'd like to leave the rest of the time for questions, so. Thank you so much. This was great, and um, who'd like to start? I'm gonna defer my comments and let Dan, please. Um, wow. It was great. That was great. That was, I'm so excited. Um, really pleased with the thoughtfulness with which you guys have gone about your work. Love the presentation and hope that uh, you'll get a chance to do that in front of the legislature many, many times. Um, oh, I'm serious. I think they'll do on the math problem. Uh, oh, no comment. Um, <laughs> they practice counting votes. Um, All right. Just uh, very illuminating. Like, great. Um, Two quick questions. One is the, I just want your thought or, or reaction to this. So the, um, the piece about Kristoff at the very beginning, um, and uh, once you got through the kind of commending the um, summarizing of the research, um, your point about 
disagreeing with the notion that uh, we've got to figure out how to weed out the you know worst per performing teachers. I'm in favor of supporting um, everybody adopting some of the best practices of the highest performing teachers. I'm wondering if those two are mutually exclusive in your mind or not. Um, I just thought it was an interesting juxtaposition, and my initial reaction was, well, couldn't we do both? But I'm wondering if maybe, I mean, I'm sure you've thought about it. <laughs> you seem to have thought about everything else. So that's the quick question, one, on that. And then two is, do you guys, do you or the committee have a position on the right mix of principal or administrator uh, observation versus peer observation? in the application of these tools? Thank you for those questions. Um, the, on the first point, uh, no, identifying very weak teachers is not mutually exclusive with identifying what practices highly skilled teachers engage in. My point was more that Christoph said our biggest problem is finding those weak teachers. It's actually not a big problem. If that's all that you or anyone else in the state wants, you don't need this at all. You don't need the system. You don't need to spend any money on this. Frankly, it's not that difficult to find teachers who are really year after year not producing student learning and aren't improving. What you need is actually to make it possible to have people like that leave the profession, leave schools. We need to make that possible to fire people, and everyone has already talked about that. It's not hard to find them. We're talking about every study we look at, the most you're talking about is 5% of the teaching force. I mean, that's, they usually don't. Most people would tell you, and I'm not being flippant, that the custodian can also often tell you uh, from just hanging around and listening who the teachers are who year after year are mean, are not helping kids learn. What we're concerned with is the next group up. There's another group up who are not that bad, but they're good at some things. They're really not very good at others, and they're not improving, and they're not getting support to improve. Maybe they're being told they're not very good, but nothing is really happening that's specific. They need... We need a system for identifying those people and saying that uh, these are the things you have to work on and you really <coughs> have to improve. And here are some of the things we know that are going to be most important to improving your performance. Then there are lots of other people who we currently call effective. I think that language is getting in our way. Who are doing in many ways lots of things well and doing other things they need to learn to do better. And the, if the Common Core comes back or whatever it is we have, they're going to have new learning needs. We need a system that gives them lots of feedback and identifies the highest leverage things for them to get better. And so what I was arguing was we want a system that can take the people who are really going to stay there. We're not going to be firing, frankly. And they need a really much more robust system of improvement that is really about getting them better and better. Because they are there to teach our students in our in the state. And we're, we do not have a system now to do that. We're so worried about finding these underperforming teachers who are a very small fraction. And I, I'm confident of that that we're not concentrating enough on the pretty weak people who need a lot of intervention and the others who could all get better. Even the very best teachers in our state could would tell you if they didn't think this was all about something threatening, would tell you that there are lots of things they'd like to be better at. So we're trying to shift the system toward that without giving up that there are some people who really shouldn't be with kids. We just don't think that's the biggest problem. Great. Does that make sense? It does. Um, Thank you. What? On your second point, she wanted to know about the balance of observation. So I'll just say that that is one of the more controversial topics because pretty clearly, um, in order to get enough observations, two things, to get enough observations of teachers and to ensure that the people observing have subject matter knowledge expertise, it would be very helpful to have master teachers or department chair, or you'd have to decide people who are practicing teachers who have expertise in the specifics to do some of the observing. And there are people in the state who think that's absolutely right, that principals should do some, and it should be added to by people who are bringing some other kinds of expertise, and there are others who worry about that. I think the Council on Balance thinks that it would be useful to advance that possibility in whatever way possible, because it's the only way we can see that teachers will get enough observation to get good feedback and enough expert observation. But balancing that, depending on how stake, high stakes this is, will take some work. Great. Thank you. Cassandra, then Michelle. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for all the work that you've done and your team has done. I think this is, um, you know, this really puts our state far and above what other states are doing, which is fabulous. Um, focusing on that balancing act for a moment that you were just talking about, you alluded to a couple of issues um, of concern, I think, in your presentation, one of which being um, 
you know, that, that your, uh, you know, there are multiple people who might be uh, part of a student's um, progress. And if you just use an assessment, you can't really delineate who those individuals might be. Um, and then also, one of the concerns that we tend to hear from teachers a lot is, with all of the assessments we do and the change, it's always a moving target. You know, every time they think they know what their priority is, the legislature or the state board or someone steps in and says, no, this should be the target, and then it's always kind of moving. And then you couple that with legislation now that says that a certain percentage of your evaluation has to be determined by student data, student assessments, things like that. Um, how do you play that balancing act um, so that the what you and your team come up with um, is something that will be stable, but also um, doesn't isn't impacted by the the changing measurements and the changing data, and you know, and and allows teachers to be comfortable um, with the the evaluations that they're getting. It, it just seems like there's it's it's a little tenuous. Um, and and how do you kind of overcome that balancing act? Um, just to be clear, the legislation requires that student growth be an increasing percentage of a teacher's um, evaluation, but doesn't <laughs> specify what the source of student growth measures are. Okay. So what we actually have to do is to put in place recommendations about disciplined ways to track student learning that can be associated with the teaching, some of which can come from standardized tests, but quite a bit of it is going to have to come from other sources. And if we don't say something about what it looks to do that like to do that well, we'll be nowhere better than we are right now. So you're quite right, and it's an important observation that every time we change all of this, it makes it hard to get stability for children because their teachers are jumping all around, and understandably so. So we're facing that very challenge. I don't have a complete answer to you because just yesterday in our meeting we were talking about the uncertainties about exactly what assessments will be in place in the state two years from now. But we have kept our eye on what to say in principle about what high quality tracking of growth can look like and how that can be done even in subjects where we were unlikely to have testing anytime soon and how that would be different from just saying, oh, everybody's doing fine or looking at their grades or something that isn't actually a measure of their growth. So I don't have a complete answer. You put your finger on one of the key issues and we are trying hard to come in with a set of recommendations that can guide improvements in the way we do that. I mean, sure. one more comment, Thanks, to be Jeff. fair, for this to work, we'd have to have the patience to think it might take a few cycles of building an educator evaluation system before it would work perfectly. Mm -hmm. If it's expected to be on the ground working everywhere perfectly next year, the chances that we'll be doing something different again in three years is very high. If we're willing to say it might take several stages to get to a point that Michigan can have what you just said, of one of the best systems in the country, we might have to plan to stick with it for a while till it gets better and better. Michelle, um, please. <coughs> okay. um, my concern, um, uh, it was a couple of things. I, and by the way, I, I am also um, really impressed with the, your, your ability to make, um, to bring to the fore how complex this issue is and how important it is. and with the hope that we can actually move forward, even though I think the legislation underlying this was ill-conceived, you know, but it's just me. Um, but my concern is about how to control for bias. And um, I come from, and I speak because I've spoken to, to teachers that have been fired recently um, based on one evaluation of a superintendent who has very little classroom experience and no curriculum experience in the subject matters where he was doing the evaluation so um, uh, and uh, and it seemed very personal and who exactly was chosen so um, I don't know if there's anything that can be um, uh, developed within the evaluation system to have some checks and balances so it's not heavily reliant on just one person and if that's something you've done and, and if you could speak on, on that. And my other question is related to that. How do you control for some of the other variables besides teaching? Is there some way that you've weighted um, if there's a high degree of, I don't know, if they, some people use the free lunch or the, the, the people who move, the tra you know, the transfers. There's just some way that's controlled in this evaluation process. Let me take your second question first. Okay. I mean, value-added models, which are a 
different collections of statistical methods for doing exactly that is one of the things that's not very well understood by the broader public. And that is what they do, is to try to isolate the contributions of the teaching to student learning. So the challenge is how to do that in the best possible way and how to measure these other variables. And similarly, when you don't have standardized tests, what to do that's approximating that. So that is what value-added growth is supposed to be about. It's just easier to say that you're going to do that. But that is the goal. Um, on the question of bias, which is a similar, those are related questions you're asking, that is the reason that we will be recommending that there be a brand name observational tool in the state because what we've seen, we've heard those stories as well, is that the homegrown observational guides don't provide enough discipline or enough reliability or validity uh, for their teachers to get unsubjective observational feedback. That doesn't mean there's no school district in the state that might build one that would pass muster, but we will be recommending a set of guidelines for what it is to be good enough so that if a district really believes that it has one, it will have to establish that it has the research base that these, you know, these more broader, but more broadly developed and research-based tools have. Mm -hmm. um, and the purpose for requiring training and multiple observations and a tool is precisely why you what you asked about. Because once you're using a tool and you're trained and it has to be reliably, there has to be inter-rater reliability, then you get much closer to what you're talking about. We also are planning to include in the report, uh, in addition to what I just said, some um, key bullets about what has to be in place in order to make this work and what can't be done if you expect this to work. In other words, things that should not be attached to teacher evaluation or be allowable if you expect this to be improvement oriented. There are a number of things people would like to hang on this, and if they get hung onto the teacher evaluation system, it will bring it down. So some of the things you mentioned are associated, like taking one observation and firing somebody. Right. If you use it in that way, it will become an untrusted and unimprovement right. oriented system. Thank you, Kathleen, then Richard, and well, John. I, I have admired your ability to focus on improvement. And this is a process to improve teaching, and that is a punitive measure, because I think the, the legislature seems to focus more on punitive than on improvement. And I wonder, have you had any, uh, what kind of exchanges you've had with any of the legislators in the past since you've been working on this? Uh, have you been talking with them right along, or what do you expect your <coughs> reception to be when you make your recommendations? I mean, I can't represent the whole legislature, but we have recurrently been talking to, um, in fact, we'll be doing more again today. We've been talking to people all the way along, giving them updates and talking about what we're learning. And I frankly feel that many of the people with whom I've spoken do understand the importance of making this improvement oriented. And whether their experience is in the business sector, where they think that their own businesses have improved by focusing on improvement, or to be truthful, some of them have been teachers themselves and remember getting an unfair <laughs> evaluation from the yeah. principal. So, you know, I can't generalize, but I do think this argument that we want children's learning to improve, that teaching matters, and that focusing on improvement of professional skill in teaching is important has one, I think has won people's alliance. How this will fare when it, you know, gets translated into legislation is a question mark, but I think the underlying principles, I have not experienced pushback on those. I have experienced support for those. Well, I, I really echo what Dan was saying, that I wish you could give this presentation to a lot of legislators. It's, it's really very, I mean, we've, we've been talking about this for a long time, and I was on a study group from NASB on evaluation, so I, I, I'm really been focused on it. You really do it in such, a, such an effective, way of explaining it. It's really terrific. Thank you. But I, I also appreciated your, that one observation is not enough. But how are principal, if, it's, if the principal is going to be charged with doing this, yeah. principals are not going to have enough time to do anything but evaluate if that's what right. they have to do three or four, especially at a high school where there may be 100 teachers or 50 teachers or whatever. It's probably a problem. Right, and one wants to have some sympathy for the high school principal who was perhaps a middle school social studies teacher and is now in the position of evaluating a 12th yeah, grade exactly. math class. Uh, it's not reasonable and isn't fair to the teachers either. So finding our way through this where there can be others who also use these tools and provide multiple observations and having, I mean, ensuring the principal has involvement, of course, 
but perhaps it not relying entirely. There are many good yourself. reasons not to rely entirely, but it has to be made safe. It has to be, we have to do this in a way that people can trust. Right. Richard, then John, then Mike. Um, That's me. Thank you for your work uh, on this. It's uh, extremely uh, clear and focused on specific skills. and. It seems to me you're going to end up with a list of skills that pertain not only to disciplines but also to grade level. And it suggests we're going to have then a profile of skills I will need to teach second grade, and another set that I will need to teach middle school English, and another set that I will need to teach uh, high school social studies. Uh, conceivably, these could be. A checklist where I, for instance, I'm I'm I have one of those old-fashioned certificates. I can teach all uh, social studies uh, classes in high school and every subject in grade seven and eight, including those I've never actually studied myself. <laughs> and <laughs> there's a little too much relish in your statement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just showing my age, as as those of you know. Um, but uh, but I've had opportunities to teach and wasn't sure if I had the skills or the, the requisite, you know, can I, ha can I handle this class? And this would be, uh, I mean, I, I see application here for, for self-evaluation, for self-improvement, uh, uh, to really motivate uh, professional development that is from, from the professional and not from the outside. I, am, I, am I understanding the project, I guess? Um, and its potential, I, correctly. Your comments are really helpful, but in fact, the observation tools are not subject specific. So, okay. one of the reasons that we've been interested in how, who does them, who carries them out, is that if you combine, if you're talking about that 12th grade math teacher, using the tool will identify things like is able to engage students in the discussion or um, is able to launch the task in ways that are comprehensible to the kids. That's true in every subject. But you want someone observing at least some of the time who understands the subject to determine whether the launch was clear from a content point of view or whether the explanation wasn't just audible and engaging but was actually correct. Yeah. So yeah. you have to put together subject matter expertise by the observer together with the tool. It's not that there are different skills. In this system, there are not different skills at every grade level, but there is different content expertise matched to pedagogical skill. John. Yeah. Well, uh, like my colleagues, I really want to uh, thank you and your whole team for you know, taking on this work and, and you know, the, the spirit and the specifics of how you proceeded uh, making this uh, successfully, I think, in the inclusive way that you've developed it with all the stakeholders. Be about improving instruction as the key to improving student achievement and helping us show the way in the state is, is wonderful and, um, again, I really appreciate that. And we are in this really difficult transition period where we, we don't have the old evaluation, we've demanded a new one, and everyone's thrashing around doing something often wildly different and or bad. And we keep wanting to encourage them, you know, that the good stuff is on the way. I mean, the robust, effective way to be supportive in your evaluation. So uh, I, I think what you've shown today is very encouraging on that front. And what I assume as you make your report to us and the legislature very soon, what I anticipate we will want to do as a board is to reflect on it, but then I hope um, we'll weigh in very strongly uh, encouraging the legislature and all of us and the governor to let's, let's embrace and uh, support these recommendations and their, their effective implementation, knowing it's, it's not going to be uh, a magic wand all at once, so that, but we should be thoughtful and very strong, I hope, in, in encouraging the approach and the specifics of that you all have come out with, uh, and I very much appreciate your your doing this for our state and our kids. Thanks, Bobby Joe. Yes, um, I'm a teacher um, in the high school, and I'm a huge advocate in what you said, um, taking minimally effective teachers and being being able to um, help them improve their instruction. And when I look at this, the big part was focus on improvement. I think in the past especially there's been a lot, okay, you're doing this wrong, we don't see this when we observe you in your classroom, but then the now what part, teachers are left with that. Well, if they had the tools, they would have done it, but they don't have the tools. And our building put in place, like I, I'm the head of a teacher group, 
we're, we're teachers that are having problems in areas. I work with them in those areas, but not every school has that. So what is the now what? Once, is there something in place? How can they improve? Um, I know there's some in-task type standards where here's what you could do if you're not doing well at the discussion thing, or is it just left up to the schools? Well, I mean, one of our strong recommendations will be that for this to work, we'll have to be coupled with different forms of targeted professional learning opportunities. So that could be schools may have somebody like you that's a you know very useful kind of resource, a professional resource, but the state could also, if we don't spend all the resources on educator evaluation, there could also be workshops and institutes on particular teaching practices that many people need to improve on. There are other states that have done that before and we're smaller than some of the states that have tried to do that. So that's one reason we don't want to use up all available resources on evaluating because then we'll be, like you just said, nothing left for actually learning to do it. And then a fallacy seems to be if you just tell people they're not doing well and tell them to do better, they'll do that. But <laughs> I think in most sectors you can't Imagine if you know if I told you you needed to jump you know an eight jump eight foot high jump just telling you to do that or offering to pay you a lot when you get to do that people need opportunities to learn I think that's what the public often doesn't understand teaching requires learning so we will have to provide that one more Kathleen yes yeah. please I wanted to ask have you making any recommendations Deb about uh, training the observers yes that will be a requirement of the system the system doesn't work. These tools by themselves don't get you there. They have there has to be training and calibration. That will be a requirement. The vendors do provide that. So part of what the if this goes forward, what the state will be in a position to do is to put out bids and do something that's financially feasible. But all of the systems are accompanied by it by training, and we will recommend that that has to happen recurrently to refresh it and to check the interrelator reliability. That's good. So to stay within the time that you agreed to come, I did want to just offer a few uh, concluding comments. First of all, Deborah, Dean Ball, you're just a treasure for this state. You know, if people haven't seen this today, most of us knew that beforehand. And you, um, I think you, you stepped up to a challenge that you knew could have some controversy around it, so I applaud you for that. And those of us that encourage you to do it, I, I thank you for taking this on. And our own gem with Joseph, I think, has added some value. I want to just reinforce two things. I think when Dan said that, um, was questioning in your answer about the 5%, my experience with the legislature is the good ones, and most of them are, um, need to hear that. Otherwise, they think that we think. I caught myself in this dilemma one day with one of them where they're, they're suddenly, what they're questioning is, you mean there's no one that should be counseled into another profession? And I think that that is an important distinction so they realize no there probably are some but the overwhelming number 95 97 percent or whatever and then i thought when michelle talked about the complexity that you offered today i think the marginal ones that maybe don't get some of this when they hear and see that it's going to click that this isn't just about you know the evaluation that they have in their mind and just one last thing is most of them have come as you know from non-education backgrounds and I would say I don't think I'd be in trouble for this but I have a daughter-in-law who loves my daughter who's a teacher but nevertheless there was a little tension when well of course you're finally evaluated I'm a branch manager and I'm evaluated every year and last year I got 20 percent growth and now I've been marked down because I didn't get 20 plus one which is the truth by the way and that's a very dog-eat-dog -dog world. So I think even with good people, there's some um, resentment might be strong, but encouragement that there ought to be a way to do this. But I think once you show the complexity, it's not as simple as people think, you know, and that's what's so valuable in the way that you put this together. And, and yet it's an admirable goal to get where you are. So we certainly, John encourages, and we certainly thank you for taking the time to thank be you with for us. Me to come yeah, thank you. Your support and interest. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. Okay, we're going to go to, we did a bunch of these, so we're, we're good. I think we're going right to Marty, right? With, uh, is that correct? State and federal legislative update. And you're welcome to stay. This is very interesting stuff. <laughs> this is, this will make your day. Thanks for the invitation. But, uh. <laughs> Thank you. 
coffee. Can I get you anything? Oh, that's very really sweet of you. No, I'm okay. I got my phone. Okay. Thanks. So. Terms of the more. Mm -hmm. Do you need anything? I'm good. Thanks. Just let me know. Okay. Yeah, we have the same thing. Thanks so much. See, it's like, yeah, okay, thanks. One year, the expectation is... Yeah. Oh, are we all? But I think even the good people, it's kind of like, oh, because the reason it's not easy, that takes some thinking. Yeah. But it should happen. Yeah. My daughter-in-law and I, it was a demeaning term of forgetting her. There's that from the I can't remember what. Who you it was, strategy, where that was, I mean, they, they were relentless, and unless you continue to overachieve, you were just, you just, yeah. Bottom five? You get a lot of people talking about It's the bottom quarter. <laughs> Which is the opposite of the demi. Marty, welcome. Thank Thanks. you. Good afternoon. Um, Couple things that are top of mind, obviously, in uh, legislative action is the uh, the two bills that are on the fast track to the state legislature: House bills 5813 and 5814, um, the so-called district or, or school building reorganization or dissolution bills. Um, passed the House last week. Um, they're in the Senate. They're trying to get the bills through before the legislature breaks for the summer. Uh, from what we have heard is that the bills um, have not been referred to the Senate Education Committee. They've been kept on the floor um, so that they can be taken up tomorrow without even going to committee. So that's what we're hearing. And so the action by the Legislative Committee to get a statement out uh, was very timely in the fact that um, these are moving very quickly in the Senate. We're not sure what the discussions are um, in those negotiations in, in the Senate. Um, but uh, we know that they plan on acting this week on that. So that's what I have to report on those bills, unless you have other questions about what the Legislative Committee um, discussed. Did everyone get a chance to review the statement that we, we sent out? Um, basically, we just wanted to reiterate the fact that while these bills may be targeting two particular districts, that the reality is they could potentially lead to more districts down the road. And so we just had a number of recommendations that we thought was important um, to, uh, to um, highlight. One being the realistic uh, timelines for disillusion. Um, we thought that the timelines that were in there may be uh, more appropriate for a planning phase than necessarily for a disillusion. Um, to create as little disruption for students as possible, perhaps by utilizing the ISD to a greater extent rather than shifting students to other neighboring districts. Um, to recognize the impact that they can, this can have on students with special needs um, and highlight the fact that if there are receiving districts that they need to utilize the IEP of the student uh, consistent with federal law. Um, and then we also thought it was important to develop a mechanism for public input and also a due process um, so that it is not simply two individuals in the state making a decision, but if that a district legitimately thinks that this decision has been come to uh, or is incorrect, um, that they have a due process uh, that they can go through to dispute the findings, um, which is uh, we thought was important. So those were just the items that we um, decided to send. And because of the timing of uh, how quickly the legislation was moving, it was decided that this would come directly from the Legislative Committee as opposed to the full board, since uh, we didn't know if they were going to be voting on it today. So, can, John, please. On, on the, I thought the Legislative Committee and these were, yeah, were excellent you know, recommendations. Uh, is, is the legislation that is being advanced right now uh, only Buena Vista and Inkster, and are, is there anticipated the need for legis future legislation that would similarly try to articulate under what conditions and what process does consolidations happen? Because um, in either case, I would hope that our recommendations would be considered. Uh, but I, I was just wondering if. I wasn't sure as you had your discussion whether you were saying these were our recommendations principally knowing unfortunately or we're not going to see change in this Buena Vista Inkster specific piece but as we proceed down this path of shaping how 
districts consolidate, we better have a better game plan that includes some of these elements, or we would recommend a better game plan. Um, do you want to? Well, technically, in, in state law, you cannot name right. districts like you cannot name cities, or so you <laughs> so you Use write legislation euphemism. using def de definers that are pretty specific. And right now, the definitions or the or the criterion used in the in the legislation as it sits now pertain to only those two school districts that you mentioned, John. Um, like I said, the bill is in the is in the Senate now. It can be amended on the floor if it doesn't go to committee. So anything can happen. Um, but I think what this what the statement does is inform the entire legislature that these are the concerns that the legislative committee on the board has in case they want to in, it, have information to um, deliberate on when they take it up on the in the full Senate. <coughs> Kathleen, please. I want to agree with, with John that this is this is an issue that's going to continue. This is not the solution. The solution. This yeah. might be okay for these couple of districts, but the whole idea of how do we deal with this growing up, well, this fits in with our finance study. But we should be getting our act together very quickly on, on the consolidation issue because they're talking about this. Is, as as Cassandra has said very effectively, we keep a, increasing the number of districts at the same time we want to consolidate districts mm -hmm. by creating charter schools every charter school is a district that doesn't count it but they don't want to consolidate those they want to consolidate the existing districts and how do we how do we handle these issues these are very tough issues and this came up very quickly it was maybe it's the right answer I'm not sure but it, it, we had to do something fast Okay, we don't have to do the other things that fast, but we should be prepared before it's a crisis again. 55 districts is a lot of districts to be in deficit. And we've been concerned about it a long time, but we haven't come up with a solution. So we really have to focus on this and do something about it quickly and get our act together, it seems to me. I agree with you, John, that we should, we should get ahead and of the should, Since we're here as a full board, does it help us to, as a full board, if we approve these recommendations as important components of any and all um, dissolution consolidation legislation. Is it possible? I'm looking for them electronically. I'm assuming. Yeah, it's not. While you're they looking for that, can I mention that? No, this is different. No, this no, is that's mine. That, this, no, yeah, this is something but, else. What we're talking about right now is uh, the bill that's under consideration still in the Senate. Oh, so this that's is not that. yeah, but I'm this talking is the charter school stuff. But. So we're looking at the legislative committee's that's, response. That's, right. that's it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you. Take a copy and pass. Thank you very much. Oh, good. Okay. I think they're the same. But yeah, they are. This one has they a are. nice letterhead. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the way the the board is thinking about this. Um, I would say, and I, Kathy just said it, there's an urgency to a couple or there will be kids not in a school building. That's just inevitable. And, you know, I wish I had a way. It, it, I think uh, the dean is modeled for us, and I probably need to be one of these to try to think about how to show how complex this issue really is. It can go all the way to, for example, um, districts that are not in deficit, I'll bet almost all of them, partly because the law changed, but almost all of them have co-pays on their health insurance. <laughs> a couple to. of these school districts we're talking about didn't have any co-pay on their health insurance. So the answer, the subtle answer that somehow it was just more money for that district, if you surgically look at it, isn't an accurate, isn't potentially an accurate answer. You know, and, and there's even some resentment in the school community when they say, well, wait a minute, we all did what we needed to do five and six years ago, and in some cases more recently because of legislation. And I'm just telling the truth, in one of these cases, it wasn't done until just this last deficit elimination plan, when finally they did what almost every other public educator has had to do for a while, and which, by the way, our community, uh, the average, for people who even have health insurance, which well, my, is a... My understanding is... Oh, if I may, just for point, okay. For people who even have health insurance, it's 28% copay. So I'm only mentioning this because there's subtleties in this argument where there are some in deficit that have done everything you could do to cut, literally everything, and now it's, it's so drastic, the kids... How can we hold them accountable for, quote, state takeover? And then there's others that are defined as deficit but actually haven't 
done anything close to what some of the others have done. Please. Sometimes there's a reason why they're not doing it, because if you open up the contract to, um, to renegotiate these things, it puts everything on the table. So that if they had a contract that was in place and was going to come up, let's say, in a year or two, they're not going to want to open up the contract, number one, the right to work would start hitting. I mean, there's, there may be a reason why they didn't, I mean, maybe they could have written a letter of memorandum or something, but because of the hostility towards I think that's a collective point. bargaining, and people are really afraid to change their contract or to reduce right. or to do anything because right. I wish I'd used a different so example stake. because that, yeah. that one actually is complicated because of right to work. But right. most of the folks did this long before that. And I'm just saying it's shocking when Carol and her team bring in and look at with, with the board and, and the union membership and others come sit at this table and, you know, they're all thoughtful. But, you know, I, I just wanted to, I'm not doing it very well right now, so I'll work on this, but there's a way to show this is much more complicated than 55 deficit districts. They are as different as day and night. And, and some are so desperate and literally, I don't know what, if I were a local superintendent again in that, in a given district, I wouldn't even know where to go. It's like, we've done everything we can do and we're still not out. So I, that's one of the other issue is, you know, as far as uh, uh, a resolution, we were really stuck on, on Buena Vista. I mean, there really is very limited authority. I know there's kind of a perception that there's a lot of authority, but you're down to like shotgun authority. You're down to trying to kill a mosquito with a shotgun. It's hold state aid, which we've done, or start a process towards an emergency manager. That's it. There's no subtle way, and this isn't subtle either, by the way, and I'm the last one who needs another target on you know my back with Dylan on this, but on the other hand, it's clear that at least in the, this is why I appreciate you're kind of thinking about it almost as a possible two-phase, where what needs to be done very urgently, but what should be more thoughtfully done as a policy as we go down the road. Because at least those two districts, it's desperate for September. It's just, we'll be there if we don't do something. And then what are we going to do? Yeah. I was reminded by a fairly well-known citizen of, of Detroit that in, 19, in the 1960s, the Royal Oak Township School Board was dissolved and the students were sent to Oak Park or Ferndale. And uh, the, uh, it was, what how they did it was to, uh, it was, uh, G. Bennett Williams was the governor. I, I was told it was Romney, but it was G. Bennett Williams. And uh, he made sure, he went down to the district to make sure they got all the board members to resign. And then he made sure that no one signed up to run for, for the board. When there was no board, there was no district. And they could act. <laughs> so we could have done that with Buena Vista. We could have just got the board to resign, and yeah. would have been the law. that's under the law now. It's, it's still the law. I've got all this. this he sent me clippings from the papers from 1962 or three, whatever it was. Wow. Wow. Was how we found all this stuff, I have no idea. But he had. Uh, so we, he said you could have done it right away. Very critical. We didn't do it right away. So I'm just telling you, you, you this, this doesn't pass, which it will, I'm sure. Uh, you can still dissolve the district that way. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Richard, you had more power than you realized. <laughs> well, say that. Oh, you meant me. Say that again, then. <laughs> I'm, I'm missing there. this. Yeah. You could it was go down. in the example, but, you know. Yeah. Just go down and make sure they don't run. <laughs> I was only half listening because I knew I wasn't governor, so I was trying to. You could have gone there and said, you know, if you guys resign, we could solve this problem. Oh, yeah, that would have worked. The <laughs> governor can appoint him to, like, the Mackinac Commission with certain powers. No, I mean, you know, if I might just say, I think we, I might have explained this in one sense, but I thought the ISD soup and the local soup and I, when we met the day before the board, did, to their credit, submit a plan that was approvable. And if I didn't say this, one reason the first one wasn't approvable is you couldn't take a district that had been losing kids dramatically each year and now pretend they were going to go up 50 percent or whatever it was the following year. It just, it just didn't pass any kind of smell test. But so we had this plan, as you know, that got derided and uh, to a fault as a camp, but it was a way to try to say federal money could at least get kids in, a, in some kind of educational place if they didn't. Now, to their credit, they did. But I, what I'm getting at is we could, I don't even know where we would go if we got to Labor Day this year without 
something to try to work this through and the kids won't have a place to go. I mean, it's, it's just inevitable in, in those cases. But I do think it's smart to try to let people know this doesn't solve it. <clears throat> this is like a Band-Aid here for right now. And uh, a necessary Band-Aid, in my view, but, but more thought to it. I think it was Richard and then John. Um, we've had a couple of crises, Highland Park, where my native city, uh, and others, and the guiding principle that, that you have followed, and, and I think the board needs to affirm um, in our own resolutions, uh, et cetera, is, the, is providing the education for the students. Our purpose is to serve students, and our support of school districts is secondary to that. So we need to encourage districts to I mean, we're a local control, and, and local districts need to <coughs> shoulder that responsibility. Um, now, I live in one of the 55, I mean, I work in one of the 55 districts that uh, is in, I, I, think, I think they're being studied right now. But one of the reasons they're in that situation is because uh, they've lost almost two-thirds of the students they had when they had three high schools, and now they have two high schools, and, and now they're going to have to now the locals tell me that they're going to have to bite the bullet and close one of the beloved high schools because they really can't justify the funding. So they're going to make some hard decisions as they've been putting off and, and they're doing this uh, in order to have a responsible financial support for, for their, their students. And, and it's painful, um, but it's right. And, and I think we need to recognize that most of the, most of the crises for the, the districts that are really hard hit is demographic shift. And that's not, that's not anybody's responsibility, but it is the, the, the local district needs to, needs to deal with that. And uh, if an area has lost uh, so many students that uh, it makes sense to combine with, uh, with other public school districts, then, uh, then that makes sense. Um, and, and those districts that are losing population uh, are not the prime candidates for new charter schools or that sort of thing either. So I, I think we can, uh, there's no one, as you've said, it's complex and each, each district situation is different. But um, uh, our guiding principle has to be guaranteeing uh, quality education for our students. In that same spirit, it is helpful to note that the districts range that are in distress from those that are in part responsible because they haven't done things that they need to do to those who situation beyond their control or they've done everything right and there's a wide continuum there. But, Definitely. you know, I think as the, to the Buena Vistas of the world do demand the kind of recommendations I think that, you know, we're eager to encourage. Keep the kids learning, mm -hmm. and as you were seeking in the Buena Vista case, but the, the notions of a fiscally responsible entity like an ISD being able to have the money for the for people to be able to make sure there's a learning program in place and allow time for the politics of consolidation, et cetera, to be sorted out makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of way we should be encouraging this, uh, this type of uh, effort to, to proceed. Yeah. I'll stay Kathy and I went to um, out to Kalamazoo to give an award to one of the schools, schools that Elementary turn themselves school. around. A green award. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we had an opportunity to meet with the superintendent, Rice, who's mm -hmm. really dynamic, really interesting, graduated from Yale. Anyways. <laughs> he told you that? No, he said he graduated. <laughs> well, he went to school, was in other words, uh, besides that, he said he graduated from Yale. And I yeah. said, <laughs> <laughs> I said Connecticut. And I said, well, I mean, people don't say where they graduated. It, they say the state. It usually means it was Ivy League and they're being bashful about it or whatever. But <laughs> said he went to Yale, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, so, yeah, no. so went to Yale. He didn't, he didn't volunteer that. But one of the things he said that struck me was that he is the fastest growing school district in the state and they're cutting like over $2 million this year. So even though that they are, you know, supposedly getting an increase in the budget, and even though they are the fastest growing and they're getting more students in, in their school district, maybe, you know, the promise and all that, um, 
they are still cutting. And he said the, the way he sees it is because of the MERS, the, the, the contributions they have to make to the, what is the? MERS. MERS. Thank you. Um, yeah, so MERS pension. is another problem. Yeah, the, not, the, not, the, not the newsletter. <laughs> um, but to the, to the pension program. And he also brought up the fact that, you know, he, and I said, well, is it, you know, and then there's people who say that these, you know, selfish teachers, they're taking all the educators are taking all the money for themselves and they're hurting the kids. And um, <laughs> so that sort of buys into that narrative. And, and uh, he, he was like, no, it's because they're creating schools in, um, without the pension fund. So it's depleting. I mean, it's the charters and the EAA, or and school, privatization and privatization, where they're um, it's depleting the funds. And so what it's doing is it's taxing these schools. And so even if, with the increase in funding, even with the increase in students, they are becoming they're cutting more and more and more. So under this um, scenario, and if we look at finances, I think we have to take that dynamic into account. And it's not just mismanagement, sometimes or overspending, it's, um, it's the whole system, yeah, how it's set up. Absolutely. I, just on that, because this is one of the points of complexity, would be the pension. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that, where is that now? Help me, Wendy or Marty. Because basically, that's where I think our friends in the ed community should at least give some credit for credit due where they're paying down some of that so it didn't go up as high as it would have gone up. So, I mean, if I were Michael, I'd want to say both. Mm -hmm. That yes, it's eating us alive, but also it would have been thirty percent. What is it it's now? It's capped it's, at twenty four point four six. So it's capped. Yeah. You, boy, you're good. I or just something. learned that from Wendy this morning. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, seriously, that it's a, it's it was a it's a bad problem period. If if you're taking a quarter of your, you know, payroll every that's which it's maybe like twenty percent of your total budget, just for pension. You know, obviously you've got a problem. But I, but what I would say is we've started to take care of that at least to some degree by trying to fund some of it. And I just think if we're not careful, what happens with some of even my friends and in, in other associations is, it, see, they also didn't like what the previous governor did, which was put it into the per pupil, and it really didn't count because then it had to be used to pay the 22, 23, 24. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was it, it was a catch 22. I would, for one, prefer for it to go towards being paid down because it was hard to explain you're getting all this new money, but you're really not because it was going away in pensions. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, you're making a very good point. I mean, this, I don't even, I don't even know if there's another state that has almost a quarter of uh, a, a payroll that's used for pension, probably in this day and age. But it's just, if that, that was a trade off for somebody who's been around as long as I have to, to a Governor Angler plan where there was a one time move in their per pupil. Yeah, so they weren't funding it properly yeah, for a long time, but, they, but now they they're blaming. moved it from the state to the local to right. responsible. By taking a one-time bump in the per pupil, which was never going to offset that. Okay. But I, I you're, uh, thank you for that, because I mean, it is, they're all so unique, and that's a, the, yeah. Calum is a very interesting example because of the growth, as you said, because of the promise, and yet on the other hand, still have to make these cuts. Yeah. And one other big factor I would just add is we have, um, I mean, I th my daughter's a teacher. I think she should be paid better than engineers, better than all kinds of folks. So, I, I meant when I said I think they all should make $100,000. I do believe that. We have a state where there's a 100% variation. So, I mean, some of these deficit districts, that are capped, that their max is $50,000. Some that come in, their max is $100,000. So, it's literally, it, there's just not one size fits all, that's all. It's a, it's a very complicated, but important. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I think Lupe had something to add, and then we yes, should probably move on because we've got to. Yes, okay. Because look, it's uh, nine minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How many items are left? <laughs> I, 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 uh, none. One. 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 Yes, ma'am. Okay. Please. We're doing pretty good, Lupe, since yes, you're since you're really beating. We're gonna feel <laughs> so good when we. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, all of us keep saying that we want to provide the best education for our students, and we're very concerned about uh, Buena Vista and uh, all Inkster and all of these uh, different schools. Now, good education occurs with good teachers. Nobody's worried about what is going to happen to the teachers and other educators when Buena Vista closes. What are they going to do? 
And so I know that the, the, the representative, what's his name, that we drew from the, mo the bill that, what? Rutledge. Rutledge. Yes, Rutledge, representative. He withdrew his name from the bill because of the language that he had inserted in the bill. And they absolutely were not going to uh, accept that language. And they was concerning the teachers. And, and so I wanted to go on record that I am very concerned about that aspect. And I know that if we turn something in, they're not going to even look at it. And that's why it wasn't persistent in it being one of our recommendations. But I want us to also think of when we're talking about uh, we want to provide good education for our students, that with good education, also the teachers are, are well, they're the heartbeat. Uh, of a school system, and if the students are transferred somewhere else, the teachers don't go with them, it's gonna, they're going to start all over again. And I know if I was in that situation as a teacher, and wait, if we think we have problems now, wait till these two groups of students try to get together and, and become one family. Right. Uh, and so without the teachers that they were used to, uh, you, they were used to, being part of the family, it's, it's going to be a tough situation. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to go on record that I am truly concerned about the workforce. They're not going to follow the students. And so as more schools become part of this formula, we're going to have more displaced educators and more students that are being moved here and there. We think it's so easy. Oh, they'll be moved forever. No, it's not that easy because they're moving into a new building with a new That's student. True. It's an entirely different family. When I used to transfer from one building to the other, mm. and people would say, oh, Lupe is coming, you know, <laughs> to my family, you know. So it's a big deal, uh, teachers coming in or students coming in. It's a big deal. Yeah. Good points. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I, I would like to. I, I agree with with Lupe. I think that taking that that uh, section out of the bill about the teachers was a big was was. I was very upset when I read that you took that section out. Mm -hmm. So I, I support yeah, Lupe completely in her position. Yeah, but uh, if we I'm turn something in like that, that, I don't know if we can. Look at it, so. <laughs> I understand if we that. We can add that to our. Statement. That, mm -hmm. that, okay. that wasn't an issue when we did this statement. No, but the, but the statement's already been sent. Right. So yeah, yeah. So I don't know if we can do anything else. Maybe they did it already today. For all I know, do they act today? He said tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. most likely. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. We're going to tomorrow. keep it on the floor. Oh. Yeah. So any further? Well, there's one more. There's one more issue okay. that was brought up during the oh, the non-retreat retreat, I guess. <laughs> um, the, the statement on uh, charter schools, and uh, it was um, voted down, I guess, at the retreat, but tabled until now. And uh, Cassandra has reworked it somewhat, and uh, is going to present what she has. Well, just as a little background, I mean, this is the, the thing that doesn't ever seem to go away, unfortunately. So uh, last month we had a draft statement um, on charter school oversight. And the reason that this particular um, statement came about is because, from my understanding, the department has essentially been doing this with the authorizers all along. Um, this is the, the format that they were using, even though in law it doesn't specifically state that the department can operate in this manner. The department, um, once they receive an application from an authorizer to start a charter school, has 30 days in which to grant the uh, district code for that particular school. And they were working with the authorizers to make sure that the, the materials that the department deemed necessary was, involved, was included in the um, applications. However, um, several weeks ago, the department uh, received um, some communication from the Attorney General's office, not necessarily related to this, but very closely related, which essentially said the department does not have the legal authority to require that the application be compliant and um, complete before beginning that 30-day countdown. Um, so basically, once they receive an application, regardless of its completeness, they have 30 days in which to um, award the district code. So um, this uh, statement essentially asked the legislature 
to codify into law what the practice had been, which is to allow the department um, to ensure that the applications are complete and comply with state and federal requirements before the 30 days, um, be the clock on the 30 days begins. So then they would have 30 days from that point to um, issue a district code. Um, there's been uh, concern expressed that um, one of the areas that might be part of this complete and compliant is an address, which would then preclude um, some charter schools from really being able to open because um, they can't necessarily get a lease or, or uh, facilities until they have a guarantee that they're going to be a school and they're going to be able to open. Um, so recognizing that that concern is there and it is a valid concern, um, this is the statement that the Legislative Committee has um, passed, um, the, not the last time we met, but we met twice this month, so before that. So we are now presenting it to the Board for consideration, um, and I will leave it at that. So does it, Eileen, please. So <clears throat> you also have um, a, a page that, um, that Richard and I are uh, uh, trying to explain why we, <clears throat> why we believe this is a very bad move. Uh, the, the bottom line is that the department exceeded its authority in trying to do certain things uh, according to the existing law. That existing law um, uh, was structured around the problems that charters have with leases and other things. So I'm, I completely understand why the department would like to have that changed. I don't think you'll find sympathy in the legislation because there's an underlying cause that has market conditions as opposed to school conditions behind it, and there is a huge issue with that. So uh, if it were based in quality of uh, charter schools or in improved student performance, I think you would have an audience for this. That's what we've been all about in all of our discussions on charters. I don't find this to be related to quality. I find it to be an administrative situation that probably won't be addressed. And I'm, I would like to say to you that there's two other ways to look at it. One is to save our salvos for quality changes that we know would impact children. And the other one is to um, recognize that this actually will cause a situation where, in at least one case, had it been the way that the department is proposing, probably would have kept a charter that we all value from opening and uh, would have caused significant problems. So. John, please. When you say the department proposing. Uh, I'm sorry. I, um, I know that the department would like to have, go back to the authority it was exercising prior to this. In We'd would, like to do whatever you think <laughs> is No, seriously. Whatever you think is appropriate is what we would carry out. And that, that is, I, but I know that there was a moment in time. We when, did. We over, we over stepped our authority. Neil and Linda are here, but let's, let's and finish And decided that. But that's not really the issue. The issue is what's good for children and what's good for, um, and, and at the same time, making it possible for the department to do its work well. I, I, I totally understand that part of it. John, uh, I just wanted to restate what I said earlier. I think we want to, on a continuing basis, um, invite uh, thoughtful ideas that we can help advance and recommend that are uh, improvements to charter school oversight, transparency, and, and quality improvement for Eileen's um, point. And we asked the authorizers and the quality charter advocates to help us with that. Um, you know, my, my understanding, and particularly the action we took last time on this item, was after we took the second page off that we were left with what I thought was a relatively straightforward um, set of information, expectations that was uh, uh, useful and important to ask for. I know, um, and I appreciate the thoughtful um, notes from Eileen and, and Richard. Uh, Dan raised this, the one complicated, in, in my mind, notion, I think it was similar to what you just said, Eileen, the, the, the address requirement may unwittingly prevent an excellent charter of the ilk that we would all support from a nonprofit to be uh, advanced versus those charters that, uh, on balance, some of us have concerns about. So. Uh, where are we in this final statement, Cassandra? Do you think, and Dan? I mean, are we? Is it is it something that uh, attends to that concern of Dan's, or? And Dan. I, I don't want to speak for Dan. I just was responding to that, and and I want to be supportive of this uh, if it's straightforward. But I also am appreciating that point. Yes, sir. Um, so as written, <laughs> I can't cannot, just to be clear, support this. Um, 
for that very reason. There, this would, I think, if we were to get, if this, if, if this were to become law, um, I should back up and say this. So at the retreat, I asked for um, kind of, hey, so what in the department's estimation are the things that are really important to have in the contract um, and what's not? Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that if we pushed for something like this or asked for something like this, that we were only actually including the stuff that was really important. Um, in the absence of that, I can't vote for this because my concern is that there are things that are unimportant that we would ask for in a contract that would keep folks who, for example, don't have a real estate shop uh, in there. So my concern here is that this, as written, would inadvertently advantage the largest charter operators who have the real estate game figured out. So only National Heritage, Leona Group, Sabas, whoever, I don't know who they are, but those folks would be the only, and, and some are good and some, some run good schools and some don't run good schools in my estimation. Um, but they would be the only folks who could open schools. The Malik Goodwin, you know, who is with the Detroit Black Food Security Network or the Bog Center or whatever, some other folks who I think are offering some innovative opportunities would not get a chance to open a school, I'm afraid, because there are things that they wouldn't be able to meet or would be much, have much greater difficult time, much greater difficulty meeting in this. So as written, I can't support this in the absence of kind of knowing what's important and unimportant. Thank you. Michelle, please. <clears throat> I'm kind of scratching my head because we were just talking about in deficit districts how you know, how horrible it was that somebody was not having to pay a copay on their medical, but yet, and we want to have, be very involved and have oversight over these deficit districts and in the finances. It had nothing to do with the outcomes. It has nothing to do with the, the uh, test scores or whatever. But yet when we talk about charter schools, now we're like, well, well we can't put any restraints on them. We should not have... Oh. Not what I said. Well, we can't put this, these restraints. This seems very minimal to me. This seems incredibly minimal. And I think maybe no we could put a waiver. Maybe there's a waiver for the issue of an address. But if you don't have an address and you're going to start getting taken in students in 30 days, well, if I understand that correctly, maybe I'm wrong. Because I've talked to people who have their, you know, they sign up their kids to the charter schools with a promise of a laptop or promise of whatever. And so they go, or promise of just a better education and innovative education. And sometimes what happens is they go there and there's no teachers. The kids have no curriculum. There's no, they're, they're, could they rush so fast without having enough oversight before they open? I'll be done in a second. <laughs> and I'm letting you yeah, <laughs> with, and Without me. enough oversight to make sure that the kids, and it does have everything to do with quality. So if you're rushing this process so they can get the money and they don't even really have a plan in order and they don't have a board to have oversight to make sure, you know, that there's, that they're really ready to go, I, I, I just see this as, it has everything to do with quality. It has everything to do with making sure you're ready to go and not rushing um, rushing in. Now, maybe there's ways to nuance it. Like you said, that if you need an address or you need, uh, maybe there could be like a, uh, some sort of a waiver. They could put what we're hoping to get this address and it's contingent upon the bank. Maybe there's some way to, uh, to address that issue, but I think overall it's, it's pretty simple. And, and if we're going to be looking at, the, you know, teachers' benefits and pay as a way to shame, you know, to talk about these things for for other for some schools, but yet we don't want to look at the fact that you know these people are double dipping on the and my that's my interpretation on the they're pay they're getting a, a, a company that's getting rent money for a million dollars a year in Detroit. You know uh, that's okay, that's okay, but that's okay. Anyway, I'm. Dan I'm then, off my soapbox now. Dan yes. and Mike, then, <laughs> Dan and Mike, then Richard, then Cassandra. Um, I, so I don't want to take any of that personally, although you were looking across the table at me. And I was <laughs> oh, no, was it right at me. Yes. Why you were looking across the table at me. Because you were right at me. I mean, That's because I'm voting right for I'm all sorts of accountability and transparency issues, right? And if this were clearly that, yeah, I would yeah, vote yeah. for it. But it's clearly not that right now. Like, it's not clear what it is because we don't have a list of what's important and what's not. So I don't know what a complete and 
compliant contract is. I mean, I, none of us know, I would argue, based on this language. And in the absence of that, I can't vote for it. Like, so all of the like implications around why I can't vote for it, or others might not be able to vote for it, I just don't think that's fair based on what I'm asking for, which is really a mm -hmm. quite, quite a simple thing if this is actually that simple. And so, I did ask um, that we bring the list, uh, the checkoff list uh, that the department asks goes through when they get an uh, application and do you have that with you? We do have, we didn't realize you wanted copies, we didn't have copies made. Oh, uh, well, you, even if you just go through it, that might be helpful. I think what I'm, I'm going to do first is go through the things that are most normally missing. Okay. Because this one gets into great detail. Um, what we kind of look at is whether or not this is a legal entity and whether or not there's governance in place and the nine pieces that we look at or that we find missing most frequently are signatures, like on the Articles of Incorporation bylaws and, and the resolutions. Uh, are the curriculum documents and educational goals in place? Are there pacing guides, scope and sequence in place? Physical plant and facilities is one. The school calendar, when will it operate and how will it operate? What are the holidays? Individual qualifications of the board members. Are they meeting qualifications and are they not um, what does the school require of its board members to comply with laws, that sort of thing? Um, teacher and administrator certification requirements and or, and or all other qualified staff. Job descriptions is what we're looking for. Certification of teachers and business officials. Incorrect school names, authorizers' names and dates. This is frequently a, a cut and paste issue and, and really secretarial we suspect and is quickly fixed if it's a problem with a school. Seat time waiver, many times they they offer a blended program, but they've not asked for a seat time waiver in order to do that. And so that's a piece that just needs to be put in place, but it's not, not, it's not done. And the educational program, how is this program unique and different? And if so, is it clearly stated? For instance, is this going to be a public safety academy, uh, school of aviation, science, things like that, and whether or not school-wide initiatives are in place for the intervention. So those are the, those are the nine that we find most frequently not addressed. The ones you just rattled off? Yes, no. I did rattle. I did. And it no, seems no, I'm sorry, like I didn't mean that pejoratively. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I, know I, have, I have a point, but I could, but I was this just going to say, if it seems like there's one particular issue that we're most concerned about, and I'm just wondering if there's a way that we can yeah. address that in here that still allows the department to be able to, I mean, because I think certification of staff is a pretty important thing, right? right? right. And if you don't have that, you shouldn't get a district code. Right. You know, I mean, there's. The, but let me ask you a question here, because I, I this is a vital and, and interesting mm -hmm. conversation. At what point, how far in advance do people apply for um, uh, for the uh, uh, for the code? Sometime in the spring, usually. So there's they're they're all hands on deck trying to get staff in and get everything done for the fall. Like spring, like March. March, April. Okay. So it's conceivable, ongoing, yeah, conceivable that they may not have the staff in place at the time that they apply. So I think what we're really talking about is how to get staging in here um, before money flows, which and is a different discussion than this. May I just add what the board may not be aware of is that charter school, charter school gets no state money until after the fourth Friday report and they get their first payment in October. So you're talking about hiring a whole bunch of staff securing a building, et cetera, like this, and you're not getting any return until at least six months later, and most charters are working on a year and a half beforehand. So it's the way to get the money. Well, there are some grants available. Grants, private money. That one, of the, one of the benefits of the charter system is that it encourages uh, private investment in public education. I don't want to be oversensitive any more than Dan, but... I just need to say something. If it was with me, I'm not shaming. I'm not shaming teachers <laughs> into reduced benefits. I was only trying to make the point that if a district decides to not have a copay and can't make a payroll, they shouldn't put me on MSNBC as if it's my fault. Mm -hmm. Right. They have those decisions to make. That's the only point. I, I could make a good case for my daughter to get 100 percent of her benefits paid if they can afford it. I just want to distinguish. I'm, I'm certainly not trying to do Sorry, that. Sorry, I was. I didn't mean to. No, no that's I. I was just saying it was. It's yeah. Right, right. It's so, <laughs> so I'm, That's all. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we can proceed. Is, is there a way to treat the issue or issues that Dan raised um, in this document? Because I, I don't think, I certainly don't want to do something that wittingly or unwittingly advantages a Leona group versus a, a really uh, effective, a good spirited charter. Um, 
so if, if we could fix it, that would be great. If, if we need more time to develop I know we. You know, this is like the, this is the fallacy Someone of sunk. Someone else can bring it I know. Back this is the time. fallacy of sunk costs. You know, anybody you know your economics. Like you put so much effort into something that you, you just you want to get it done, even if the smart thing to do is to. Um, you mean like fast track? Uh, so the best example. My 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 college roommate was an uh, is an economist, and then his wife was in labor, and she's in labor for like forty some hours. And, you know, at, at that point, they said, we need to do a cesarean. She goes, no way you're doing that. I'm having this baby, you know, because you just really want to make sure to, you want to, you put this much effort in, you've got to get it done. You know? I'm so. not giving birth to this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I draw the line. Yeah. No, but I, we, we need to, we need to, we definitely want to have a lot of tough, and I'm with Dan, um, robust, effective uh, rec ideas and recommendations on oversight, transparency, and uh, if we need to, continue to work on this as part of that, that's you know, great that's, too. That's but. fine, but then people need to make recommendations. Yeah. I mean, all I get right now is, right. I don't like this. Right. Okay, well, how do you fix it? You know, telling me you don't like it doesn't really help me. You got to tell like me. It's kind of like teachers, kind of like evaluation. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> tell right. me how you, because I am well, completely I, so open to I'm making I'm with you. So. I, all I can come up with is, <laughs> let's see the list of things that would currently make a contract compliant and complete, and let's try and figure out, and this may be a too far a dive into the weeds, but if we could figure out the staging issues, as Eileen says, around that, right? So. What is it? What is it? What is it appropriate to to ask a charter operator to have in place five months before a school opens, four months before a school opens, two then two? I don't, and that may be diving too far into the weeds. I don't know, but I won't know until I actually see the list and try and get into that work. If that still makes sense, then great. If it doesn't, then. Can I'll come I, back and say, you know what? I did my homework, and I can't come up with a way to fix this that makes sense. Can I just say, I mean, this this talks about the technical compliance to ensure that it has the required components as set forth within this act. So, you know, if it's already in law, all we're saying is follow the law. So the question then becomes, what are the specific items that are set forth in this act? And, you know, maybe that's what we need to take a look at. I mean, if... if if the law already says you have to have X, Y, and Z in place, then why shouldn't you have to have X, Y, and Z in place? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's all we're saying. Linda and I just <laughs> talked offline, and if you, this is your call whether to vote today or not, You're totally, so I don't want to get in the middle of that one. But, <laughs> but if you choose not to, we would come with a recommendation based on some of the discussion at the legislative committee, and then you could further to the discussion there, but we would come with kind of a specific plan based on what we think we heard today. But maybe there's been enough talk, too, so I don't want to yeah, prejudice that. This is a that. standard way of, of drafting recommendations. But it'll, if, if it's already in law, it's just a reference to that, that act. It's already in law. We do that all the time in legislation. Look, I, yeah. just to be clear, I'm fine with voting for, with calling the vote, okay. I would just end up voting no. I don't know what's in law, so I just pulled up the statute, I'll have to go look at it and so on. Like, I don't know if the law, to me, would make sense for charter schools then. It's been my next question, right? Because I just don't think it's fair to ask, currently, the way that we finance buildings and so on in the state, to ask a small charter school with promise and potential to have a building lined up five months before they open when they don't have a school code, they don't, I mean, like, it's, so then I would say, you know, the recommendation that I would want to make to the state would be change the law, right? Or the recommendation that I made two meetings ago, which is I still can't figure out for the life of me why we have any school in the real estate business at all. And it seems to me that we should be figuring out a way from a policy perspective to have traditional districts and charters, right, not in the real estate business at all. That's just, I, to me, that's the asinine part of this conversation, but that's a whole different, different and, and subject. Just give, given that, and just to try to... So I'm happy it. to call the vote. I would just end up... And, and I, I will have to join Dan in voting no if we do it, um, mainly because I, I, I want to support the direction that we're going with this, but I think we'd be stronger if we as a board came to um, support ideas that uh, we all can support or that the majority supports, including those like Dan and to some degree myself who are known charter advocates who are supporting charter transparency, oversight, and policing requirements. I mean, I think it, it really is more helpful when we 
get to recommendations that are strongly supported, that are improving oversight, transparency, and policing that we all can support ideally. Uh, and I, I think we're close. And I, I, I apologize that I don't want to uh, take away from the effort and interest to move this forward. But I, I don't think it helps us to uh, advance something that we're going to have opposition from within our, our folks. Richard, Michelle, and then do you want me to call the vote? Um, I just wanted to, to uh, suggest that uh, in, in my view, this effort is misplaced because it's the responsibility of the chartering agencies um, to do some of this, this, uh, this policing. Now, who are the chartering agencies? Well, they are our existing traditional public school districts, our uh, intermediate school districts, and state colleges, uh, and, and I guess the uh, community colleges. So these are all public boards that have to authorize um, and nominate the, the boards of directors for these schools. It, it is their responsibility then, and I think um, uh, we are, uh, so I think it's inappropriate for us to uh, draw up specifics uh, and, and take their responsibility on ourselves. I think the, you could make the argument the original intent in the charter school law was that the state uh, board or the um, Michigan Department of Education operates as the fiscal agent on behalf of these chartering agencies. Uh, and so the, the purpose of giving this of the state is uh, having them authorize a, a number uh, is simply uh, to assist the authorizing bodies uh, then with what they need to proceed forward. And as I say, there's a big investment of, uh, this is one of hundreds of things that have to be done before you're ready to submit a count to the state and actually get some money from the state. Thank you, Michelle, please. Um, and Kathleen. Yeah, and this, okay. So what I'm hearing is that maybe if there were some adjustments made, Dan and John, you might, okay. Um, but we've had this on the table now for many months. Several. Two. Mm -hmm. Several months. So, um, but I would propose, or a thought, um, is that there be a preliminary approval pending, um, and then, so, let's say July 1st or something like that, if they don't have everything in order, um, that they have to have it done at, by then, otherwise they don't get the money on count day. So that, that maybe there's a two, like you're staging or two tier, but there ha so to overcome the issue that you know, we're months in advance, but if they don't have it together by a certain point when it's you know, a month away or whatever, to, uh, half away when they're supposed to have, then I think that, um, that they shouldn't open be to stop sort of some of the problems that happen with some charter schools where they open and they're just not prepared, they don't have teachers, it's chaotic and it does affect, strongly affect student outcomes. So I think that's, I, I just wanted to also, just to understand the process. Because, um, you know, ideally when I learned about charter schools, it was this idea that it would be community driven. People in the community would go to one of these author, you know, they would work in tandem um, with going, you know, going to CMU or whatever, and they would, um, but somehow uh, somebody in the community would be in control of what was best for their community, if I'm understanding correctly, and that the, they would go to CMU or wherever uh, to start a charter school, and um, that, that it would back basically be educators or, you know, certain people who wanted an alternative type of school. And they would then decide what management company, if they wanted to use a management company, would come in. But what I'm understanding is that the management companies are coming in, and instead they're telling CMU or whoever, maybe it's not CMU, who they want to be on their boards. So what I would want to see is some compliance with this understanding that it's not the, the um, it should not be driven by the management companies. Um, to decide when and where their schools, that it really should be, is there some way to ensure that it is more organic and that there is true oversight? We had 
um, the gentleman come from um, the one school, Detroit Enterprise. Yeah, Detroit Enterprise, and trying to have some say on these boards, and was told he could only control a little bit of the money, and then we hear about these sort of, to me, in my mind, uh, uh, hiking of rent to skim it off the top <laughs> for whatever reasons, good or bad. Um, but there's no oversight of this. And how can we as a board know this and not address it? And, uh, this is what I'm, we, there, there are many, many uh, needs and opportunities for us to um, push for, advocate for, and ask for a variety of fixes for real problems around transparency, self-dealing, and quality control. And I, I really want us as a board to, to continue to develop those and with all the help that all those in the business can offer about what those are and how we advance them. And so yeah, absolutely, and those could be the nature of what we need to keep a building, particularly as we move ahead. So I, and I think some of your suggestions are perhaps part of what could be incorporated in a, a next version of this with the help of the department, including the pacing of stuff. But I mean, this was a very small band of, of the bigger field of, that we need to be active in. And so I, I just want us to try to get it, get it uh, where it needs to be so that we're hitting the target we're trying to hit. I think it was Kathleen and Richard. Well, yeah, I voted to recommend this to the board because I thought we discussed it long enough and we should vote on it. You're, you're making a motion, but, uh, <laughs> but then I'm ready to second it. <laughs> Lupe is a, is a mover. But, but She's a mover. I don't think we have the support to pass it here. It's obvious. Right. So I, four. Uh, I think John's suggestion is that we would broaden it and include this in a wider net of things that we think should be improved with the charter schools, including more transparency for the management companies, which we have pushed and had special recommendations to the legislature half a dozen times. When it was a majority Republican board, even, we did that. And uh, we've done it for years, and we still haven't gotten it. It's something we, still, we, should, we should still be pushing. So I would recommend that we uh, take this back to the drawing board and use this as a starter <coughs> margin. I think the other advantage of that, Kathleen, as you're saying, and John started, is I think it's more likely to be received by a broader group who actually vote on this stuff if we have it as part of a bigger package. Yes, it doesn't I look like so we're, mm -hmm. we're kind of cherry-picking yes. certain issues. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. But we were there last month and the month before. Exactly what you're saying. That's true. Exactly what Johnny's saying. Exactly what... Everybody saying that's where we were, and then I made I I had made the motion. I withdrew the motion with the understanding right. that at this meeting we would discuss it and vote. Make the on motion. It. That a motion. Make the motion. And then All we're still question. at the same place that we were two months. Well, let's away. let's do and that. Then the motion. Plus, we are diligently <laughs> in the legislative committee doing our work that you ask us to do, and we work very. Make Diligently, the it, I'll second it. Yeah, we'll, but you're not gonna vote I for it. Let's have the vote then. You know, we we cannot do business like this because we're just spinning our wheels every month. And look at all the time we spend in this, and we spend the same amount of time last month and the time before and at the retreat. So we have to make up our minds as to what is it that we want. Well, now we want a broader Did, did you want to make a motion, head. seriously? Okay. Or? We got to, we got to. Well, we don't have the vote. Yeah, but well, she's, <laughs> she's going to make a motion? She's just making a recommendation. That's not a motion. I don't, I don't, I, I don't think know. I mistakenly didn't get a motion on the floor before starting no, it. No, we but, didn't get one. But Actually, it was at the retreat. It was voted down. It was reconsidered and tabled. So there okay. is technically a motion. Okay, there's oh. a table there. Good. <laughs> so now what the heck do I do with that? Am I the new speaker? <laughs> yes, sir. I call the question. Call the question. There we go. Okay. Uh, all, in, all in favor, aye. No, you didn't, aye. You didn't second. Sec you didn't second. Either. Second. <laughs> okay. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, aye. same. Opposed. Nay. Nay. This is this is. I think we need a roll call. Call the question. Oh. Oh. Aye. Call the question. Call the question. Aye. 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 Call the question. <laughs> okay, so the first vote was, do we want to do that again? The first vote was on calling the question, right? Okay. All in favor? Discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same? No. Okay. Does John know? Yeah. Okay. And now we are calling the question, and all in favor, aye. Aye. 
of the question? Of the, or the question itself no. now. What on is the on actual on the resolution? State voting on the resolution. This resolution? Yes. Yes. Oh. So all in favor Statement. of that resolution. I thought we weren't going to vote on it today. Well, we are. So uh, we have all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Opposed. Aye. 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 Opposed. Roll call, maybe, just to be <laughs> yeah. sure. Here. Sure. Austin? No. Uh, Fecto? Yes. Ramos Montine? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Um, Farner? No. Weiser? No. Ziley? No. Okay, question. Exactly, we started. So, nope. But it sounds like there's some. But we had a summer to do a lot of things because yeah. it sounds like there's a, oh, a is, commitment to. Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> there there are so many. I think John's been consistent with the theme about quality as the whole board has, and this is maybe the opportunity to tackle yeah, that bigger still, question. Let's do everything at once. I've been fine with that. Quick question, Dan, yes, just for Linda, I, so I can go do my homework. So I have as the appropriate statute here that this is referring back, the 507 is referring back to the actual what has to be in the contract is section 5036 A to P, subsection 6, subs A to P. Is that? Okay. While they're looking for that, are we, are we, other than that, are we done with that section? I'll move on to complete the. So we have a <laughs> consent agenda. I move the support for the consent agenda. Moved by John. Supported by Dan. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you. Comments by board members? Yes, yes ma'am. Um, well, Michelle mentioned that we had gone to the school in Kalamazoo. I went to four reward schools, and it was really very interesting. A couple of them were in Detroit. Uh, one was in Dearborn. Those were big schools, 1,000 kids or something. Uh, the Dearborn School is a handsome building, very good-looking building. And the uh, population was largely Arabic, almost exclusively Arabic. The uh, school in Detroit was almost exclusive. Was, it was, it was uh, mostly Hispanic, but some African Americans. Uh, it was it was interesting to see the we're very school. segregated our schools. Yeah. That's that was quite obvious. One was a charter school in Harbor Woods, and uh, where was the other one? Well, Kalamazoo, and they were they ranged inside from the Kalamazoo school was a couple of hundred students, it was K three, and the uh, the school in Dearborn was like a thousand students, and it was just the an elementary middle school, so it was a middle school graduation. I wasn't the graduation; it was an honors program, and it was really wonderful. The kids, the kids are great. In every school, the kids are great, and they really, the schools really appreciated the recognition. But the students are so bright, uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I mean, they, they are. Each one had its own personality, but they were all, they were, they were all different, but similar in that regard. So I appreciated having the opportunity to do that. That was really worthwhile. Thank you for doing it. We're going to offer that every year, the reward schools and map it was them out. four schools, and none of them were the high achieving schools. These were all either high progress or beating the odds. Yeah. And those are actually the ones that need the most encouragement. Right. I think those are great for you very, to visit. Uh, I visited some also. Yeah. In, in, in Kalamazoo, it was the end of the year program, and they had a picnic outside afterwards. The parents were all there. The parents were there at the school in Dearborn. The parents were there at all of them, as a matter of fact. So it was really interesting. There was a lot of parental involvement in these schools, which is one of the reasons they're beating the odds. So we'll plan this each year. Does that right. make sense? And then board can take what works. Doing. Yeah, I agree. Richard, please. I just want to mention I brought uh, greetings. Um, Behalf of the board to Detroit Public Schools at their Project Seed uh, mm -hmm. recognition oh, last oh, week, great. and um, this is a, a 50-year-old example of community resources uh, providing tutoring, particularly in math and science, for uh, mm -hmm. students in Detroit. That's an excellent. Did you go speak, Richard? Beg your pardon. Did you speak? Yes, ma'am. Oh, good. It's just, just what good. Talk about what I'm I'll talking about. John. I, if we're not meeting until August, although maybe we'll have a meeting to talk about the study, but the Common Core, I gather, this 
process from here means we all need, and I know the department will, to share the, just the facts why the Common Core makes all the sense in the world over the months ahead. But then hopefully as we do that, there will come a time when I think we all need to help with Democrats and Republican legislators in whatever way we can to encourage them to affirm the Common Core. I hope that that's what we will do and we'll all work hard to be persuasive with folks on the Democrat or Republican side. And I appreciate in particular the efforts of everyone on that and, and Eileen, I don't know how active you've been, Richard, but Eileen's efforts with um, with her side of the aisle, um, much appreciated. And the, But the most important thing we didn't talk about yet, and that's the PETA, the People for Ethical oh, yeah. Treatment of Animals, mm. oh. you all got the email. <laughs> No, I'm so did yeah. anyone want to be the champion of opt-out from dissection for those students who uh, want a non-animal assignment, which New Mexico and Massachusetts and Flint and Warren Consolidated Schools have put in place? I'm asking for our support. Does anybody care about this important issue? I'm not actually, being... I, I actually walked out of a class. I wouldn't dissect the frog when I was in grade. I, I don't know how to, I mean, the, to their credit, they care about this. They're trying to get some attention to it. I'm sure they're well-intentioned, and I don't know if there's anything more we yeah. can do to advance it, but we could. Uh, I am willing to study it. I don't know that I would support the recommendation, mm -hmm. but. Uh, could you take a look at it if sure. you're willing? Yeah. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's a no downside uh, suggestion, then it's something we should do. If, there's, if it's complications, then we should know what they are. Do you have a, a reference yes. for Dan? Um, it's MCL 380, 501 through 507, and 507 is... We'll email that to... Oh, good. Why don't we email... Can we email that to the board? Say, say that again. It's okay. MCL... Sorry. 380.501. I was going to say one more. 380.507. Apologize. Okay. Yeah. With 507, we're getting a great deal of the details. And then, and then, just to add on to that, we need to look at it also for various kinds of schools. So that would be the basic part. And can we do some sifting for you also? Mm -hmm. Is there something, Dan? For me? Yeah. I'll look at it. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I, I didn't know if I was going to bring this up, but it's it's been very disturbing to me, and I've been I had the opportunity to meet with about ten teachers, current and past, at EAA schools. And also, I met with another one yesterday who was there. And um, with a lot of the information, I've asked them to <coughs> come and testify. Many of them are terrified for their jobs or feel really mistreated. Or, but the one I talked to yesterday, uh, she was a former teacher at Nolan um, Elementary, uh, said she would um, step forward. But some of the things that I'm hearing are just in such stark contrast to what I'm reading in the papers. And um, I, I may very well just try to summarize in writing um, uh, and offer it as an op-ed or something what I'm hearing. But I think it's, um, I think these people are very credible. Um, I don't think that they're anti-EAA, I think, and I think they're very much for the kids and they spoke out in concern. But they were saying things like, uh, sort of um, reflects what the young man was saying, that it's ver it was very chaotic. Classroom control is a really tough problem for a lot of the young teachers. Um, there's not, there was no curriculum uh, available um, until, for many of the subjects, until January. Some people didn't get access to Buzz until March. Um, that, you know, that when there's tours that come through, Certain kids that misbehave are put into classrooms with teachers for two hours or more, not allowed to go to the bathroom because they don't want them in the hallways while there's a tour. It's a, it's a I mean, I'm, I'm hearing, and, and, um, and this is from teachers across a span of schools, and teachers, uh, one teacher, she was a, a Teacher America teacher. She's her first year there. She's the only teacher left that was hired in the beginning of the school year. And the, the turnover rates are incredibly high. Even though teachers are certified in some areas, they're moved around and put into places where they don't have the proper certification. So they'll say the teachers are all certified, but they don't have necessarily the proper certification for where they're at. And um, so I, I, 
offer this to you, and I know I've been someone who's had my some serious reservations about the EAA, and so maybe you can dismiss what I'm saying, but I think these teachers and some of the students I've talked to as well, um, uh, they they made me, they convinced me that it's even worse than I, my reservations were. So I know there's probably other people who will say they love it, but I'm talking, these are teachers that, that still want to try to make it better, that some of them, most of them want to leave and never come back. They were like, they're all looking for other jobs, but, um, but they felt a, a sense of commitment to the students um, there, and they're, they're very brokenhearted about the whole situation. So I just want to say Yeah, it's, it's. Yeah, well, I thought we should follow up on the recommendation that was made by the Professor Vang, I think her name is, yeah. uh, to, to look into what, what she had to say today. I think that, that that's an obligation on, on the part, our part, on the, on the part of this department. To, to look into. into we should ask Dr. Covington, at the very least, to come back in August, do a little after action review, right? They will that's have completed their idea. first year of operation in, mm -hmm. in late July, early August. We won't have a July board meeting, so they will have one full complete year under their belts, and he can come back. And that's I think, frankly, idea. that we should just place those critiques in front of him. I mean, let him know that. We're going to ask him about these and have him come and address them in response. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And maybe I can even and, get some of the teachers sure. to come forward at the yeah. same yeah. time. I mean, it'll be end of the school year, so those who have secured employment elsewhere will be happy to come and talk, right? I hope so. There's nothing to lose. Well, yeah. What, yeah, that because you know this is again is a little bit it like our earlier. I have oh. had had some same, mm -hmm. some of the some of the similar experiences to Michelle. I don't know. Teachers have told them with the same kinds of stories that they, did, that they are coached before tours <laughs> what to say, about what not to say, yes. and threatened with dismissal if they don't follow that instruction. So that's, that's sort of scary. So if we hear from Dr. Covington, he's going to say things that are, mm -hmm. things are positive. Spin. Of course you are. Just like so we have also have to hear from some of these people and say that that's not all necessarily the case. I agree. Well, why don't we, uh, I'd be happy to offer that on behalf of the board, that invitation. Mm -hmm. um, worst case, I don't think he would uh, turn that down, but in, that, in the event that timing or something didn't work <coughs> out, we should at least submit uh, those kind of thoughts to him. But I, I, why don't we take the positive that with enough notice he'd be able to make that meeting. And I know they, they we hear mixed, you know, we hear everything from A to Z. Right. And, and frankly, on many districts, not just the EAA. I mean, in fact, yeah. the EAA is, is one of the, we hear less about that than some other districts that you then say, okay, we're a local control state. You wonder how much of this is accurate. It's worrisome. I mean, the turnover type issues you're talking about, we've heard a lot of that. Now, how much of that do you attribute to a startup that maybe is, is part of what happens? How much because of other issues that might be there? But I think he also kind of would feel a responsibility to uh, be available for that. I think, does that sound good to the board then, to answer yeah, Jackson? We also, we need to, is the way clear to get the emergency managers in as yeah. we were planning on before the lawsuit issue prevented it? Um, I mean, that's another thing on our agenda. Yeah, I, I don't, I've <laughs> lost track of that. Yeah. I've well, got it on the list. Okay. Right. Mertz is always on top of these things. I, I don't know how long. Uh, Roberts agreed to. I don't think it's long. I think he was getting them Six through. Six months is what the papers said. Yeah, well, he, he called the other day. I don't know that he's going to go. <laughs> okay. Well, let's, Mertz has that, and we'll. I saw Don uh, Weatherspoon and got an earful at the uh, funeral home last night. I said, hey, I'm off hours, buddy. <laughs> You're never off hours, this is the problem. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Good, thank good you. meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for coming over. By the end of the year. What's in here? Yes, sir. Your last comments reminds me of the saying, a professional oh, has the privilege of taking.